The Zodiac Files Debate Series, Volume 3, Richard Grinnell versus author Ray Grant. Uh, some brief channel news real quick, guys. We got some subscriber-only shows coming up. We got some membership-only shows coming up. If you look below the subscribe button, there's a member join button. We have three levels of memberships. That is the Gorilla, the Inspector, and the Vigilante. Feel free to use those. I will prioritize super chats i will prioritize super thanks in the comments feel free to chime in uh we do have a decent size interview coming up tomorrow which i'll announce at the end of the show but without further ado guests of the hour we got richard grinnell and ray grant so fighting in the top corner representing coventry the united kingdom richard grinnell zodiac ciphers.com the Zodiac Speaking Podcast, fighting in the bottom corner. I believe he's out of Pennsylvania. Ray Grant, Pittsburgh. author of Zo Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Ray Grant, author of Zodiac Solved. Feel free to join us in the chat. Gentlemen, Zodiac Killer you... Solved. There you go. Zodiac Killer Solved. Anything you guys uh, want to uh, tell the audience before we begin here? <laughs> Not really. No, just glad. Perfect. To me. To I have so much content, I wouldn't even know where to begin. Yeah, uh, check out Ray's channel. Uh, he's been doing some walkthroughs over there, so you guys can check that out. I think we have some disagreements on the Riverside uh, uh, timeline. Ray, you can, you and I can address that. If, um, you, if you want to check me out on YouTube, all you have to do is uh, type in Ray Grant Zodiac. You can find uh, my old, I just found out, you can find my old website on the web archive on the Wayback, Wayback Machine. It's nice. thezodiacmurderssolved.com. And all you have to do is go on there and just be sure to um, scroll down because it's, uh, you may have a little bit of trouble navigating. The, it's like a, a little bit of an older site, but um, what else? I have a book, I have a book on Amazon, uh, Zodiac Killer Solved. And uh, I think that's about it. Uh, before we get started, Ray, did you want to apologize to me and my uh, audience for the comments you deleted uh, about me on uh, YouTube? And uh, You know, I said one little thing about you, which you uh, got very upset. All I said was when you when you called uh, Robert Conley and um, Frank Gasser squirrel hunters, and I just said something about Ross not being a serious researcher. Then Ross goes uh, on, was it on Tom's board? Yeah. And calls me a bitch, you know, so I mean. <laughs> well, things, you know, got slightly out of control there, but but it, it, yeah. here's the thing. Right? Well, here's the so, other thing. I mean, I took the comment down before I thought I had, you know, I thought better about it after a minute or two. So I took it back down again, but it wasn't fast enough for you. Apparently uh, yeah. you saw it, so. That's right. That's right. Okay. Okay. He's a lot more sensitive than I am. I mean, if I were that sensitive, uh, after I'm, I'm, uh, I started on the Zodiac killer case in 1985. So if I were as, which is probably before Ross was even born. That's so right. if I were as sensitive as he is about the criticism, I'd be dead by now. Well, I'm not that sensitive, Ray, but here, here's the problem. Then you made a video of Lake Herman Road where you got uh, Connolly's na name wrong in the entire right. video until you corrected it in the comments. Yeah, I, so well, the other thing is here. it's like William Crow and Robert Connolly. Right, and, you got tripped on that, up on that yourself. Yeah, and I just started saying, I just started saying uh, William Connolly over and over again. I said that about 11 times, but right. so the it's question easy to do, is, is it's, it's point, the right? same problem that you run into doing these is that are you going to wipe out like three hours of content just for the sake of like one mistake? Probably not. It, exactly. So uh, let's get started, gentlemen. Uh, Ray, let's just get like a two and a half minute primer of, of your theory. And then uh, Richard and I will come back and, and deconstruct that on the uh, on the canonicals. Could you just summarize the, the, the theory of your book and your overall suspects and Zodiac theory? Well, I mean, the, the general theory, which I have had now for, as I said, since 1989, is that the Zodiac Killer was four people. Uh, a woman named Berta Margulies, who was a member of the New York group, along with Jackson Pollock and Robert M Motherwell and people like that. Um, she was born in uh, 1907 in Poland. She died in Walnut Creek, California, in 1996. 
The second conspirator was a man named Yu Penn, who was born in 1913, uh, passed away in 1995. Yu Penn was a cryptographer for the Army Air Corps during World War II. Um, he also worked, he was a statistician. I, sh I should say, Berta Margulies was a sculptor. She was the first secretary of the Sculptors Guild in New York City in 1937. As I said, she is a member of the New York group. She's primarily a sculptor. Uh, Yu Penn uh, was a statistician for the California Highway Patrol back in the 1960s. Uh, in the 1970s, he was also a statistician, but for the California Attorney General's office, uh, in other words, the DOJ. Uh, the third conspirator was um, uh, Yu's son, Gareth Penn, who wrote Time 17. Um, Gareth and I became friends because we were both in Mensa back in the uh, mid-1980s. Uh, Gareth was Gareth had multiple degrees from Cal Berkeley um, for, um, I guess, uh, Germanic uh, literature, you know, um, just his historical Germanic, Germanic, um, uh, whatever you want to call that. Um, the the translation of Germanic uh, things like Beowulf and so forth um, to, I guess, to English, but it's uh, um, um, <clears throat> comparative literature, primarily uh, Germanic. But he also had a uh, librarian's degree from Cal Berkeley. Um, and the and uh, Gareth was the Berta was the person who planned the the um, Zodiac project. Uh, the Zodiac project was intended as a um, conceptual arts project along the lines of if people are familiar with the Gates in Central Park by Christo. Uh, Yu Penn was the cryptographer, um, and. Um, uh, Gareth Penn was the PR man, basically. It's Time 17 is essentially a clue book to uh, the, the Zodiac murders. And then uh, the fourth conspirator was the trigger man, Michael O'Hare. Michael O'Hare uh, was born in New York City in 1943. Gareth, by the way, is born in, in um, I guess, in San Rafael in uh, 1941. Michael was born in 1943 in New York City and uh, went to Bronx Science uh, High School in New York. Uh, he went to Harvard from 1960 until 1964. He was a member of the Harvard rifle team when he was there. He, had, uh, he has multiple degrees from Harvard, including a degree in, um, I, uh, he has a degree in architecture. I think he has a degree in advanced mathematics. I think he has a degree in um, mechanical engineering. Uh, he has a PhD from Harvard. He um, worked for Arthur D. Little in San Francisco during the Zodiac period. That was their office was on Stevenson Street. He was the trigger man for the project. He is the person who actually went out and killed people. Although the first two murder events, which were Riverside and Lake Herman Road, there were multiple Zodiacs participating. Uh, Michael was a uh, professor at, after he left um, Arthur D. Little. He was a professor at MIT between 1971 and 1979. Uh, from 79 to 81, he worked for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. He was a, a lecturer in public policy at the John F. Kennedy School of Government at Harvard from 1981 until 1990. When a book written by Ray Grant landed uh, on the faculty there, I sent uh, copies of my book to all members of the faculty, in uh, all 90 members of the faculty. <clears throat> in um, November of 1990, the following year, he was working for uh, the Goldman School at Cal Berkeley, which is their public policy school, and he has been there ever since. He lives, uh, he lives in Berkeley. Prior to that, he was living in uh, Brookline, Massachusetts. So essentially, a publicly accused, originally publicly accused four living people being the Zodiac Killer. Two of those people are now dead. Two of them are still alive, but they're in their 80s. So uh, Gareth Penn 
is well gareth penn will turn 83 in january michael o'hare will turn 81 in january <clears throat> so but that's where we stand right now yeah so i have a couple issues with the theory i'm sure richard does as well uh I, I, who is writing the letters in these theory, Ray? Because I'm, I'm a little confused. The cipher constructor was you, Penn. As far as who the people have pointed out, there have been um, handwriting experts who have pointed out that the ciphers appear to be to have been done by a different hand than the, than the writing in the letters. Okay, I think that's probably true. I think the, the letters were written by Michael O'Hare. The ciphers were written by you, Penn. Um, so that would, that would explain why the, the two hands might look different. <clears throat> here's my, I'm going to let Richard respond, but here's my problem, uh, Ray is I don't see anything that connects Riverside to the canonical Zodiac crimes. So, so for someone that's been looking at the material as long as you, I don't really see why you compound Riverside with, I mean, I guess you have this, your own side theory with your own suspects, but I don't really see how you can compound Riverside with the canonicals. Quite literally, the only connection is the fact that this typed confession letter is semi-similar to some language that the Zodiac used, but as Richard has already broken down on his website, that can all be reverse engineered, recreated through previous uh, articles that were already, already publicized. So w what evidence do you have connecting your suspects to the Riverside crime that you're that sure that it connects to the overall, you know, conceptual art project here. Well, first of all, I would I would estimate that roughly 50% of the people who post on Zodiac Killer message boards and and also the researchers involved in the case believe that Sherry Bates was a Zodiac victim. Doesn't for, it seem that way to you? For, for, for what reason, Richard? Because because Riverside announced this originally and then went back on it? Like, I need well, no, I'm just making the point that this isn't exactly, you know, if there were no Ray Grant, there would still be about half the community following the Zodiac who would believe that Cherry Bates was a Zodiac victim, right? I mean, that, that's that's that's. Pulling. Well, do you want me to count off the names? Let's see here. No, no, we no, have Tomboy no, believes no. it. Mike He's Butterfield, Mike one. Butterfield, and I aren't exactly Cater cousins, but Butterfield believes it. I mean, how many examples do you want? Does Butterfield believe that, Rich? Do you know? Yes. Okay. So, uh, well, well uh, even it's still, a lot of well, people. Sherry Joe Bates is a very good victim. Yeah. I'm sorry. Um, yeah, I don't know. I can't, on... I can't remember uh, what, what my. Michael Butterfield's opinion is of Sherry Joe Bates. What What are you saying? He doesn't believe it. No, there's no Zodiac question victim. that Butterfield believes uh, Sherry Bates was a Zodiac victim. M more, more importantly, more importantly, let's go, go down. News for that. What, what What evidence, Ray, connects Sherry Joe Bates to the Zodiac? Right. So you have Sherwood Morrill's opinion that Correct. everybody later dis discounted. Right. You have a desk bottom poem that quite literally doesn't mention Sherry by name, isn't even referencing the clothes she was wearing, was possibly written a year before referring to the uh, Taft crime. So what else do we got here, Ray, other than the typed confession letter, which, which even well, that let me turn the recreated. question back on you. Yeah. What do you have that disproves that she isn't a Zodiac victim? Quite a bit. The fact that all, all the evidence of the case points to a local random crime of Crime oh, passion. bullshit. Like, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no. What, what bullshit, Ray, is is when you say on your timeline that she goes into her house and finds her bibliography. Therefore, if, if that happened, Ray, you would not have the Sherry Joe Bates crime. She would quite literally be alive today. The whole purpose of her going back to the library was to get the books to rewrite the bibliography. In your video, you said rewrite that she probably... The, uh, you, well, she wouldn't be rewriting the bibliography, but... Uh... Uh, I'm sorry, what did you say before? You said she went back to her house and probably found the bibliography. I believe she went back to her house, yes. Well, at that point, then she doesn't need to go to RCC, Ray. <laughs> so, so, the, so the crime never happens. If she found the, the, you, the paper Apparently you don't for. understand what a bibliography is. A bibliography is a list of books that your teacher gives to you 
to basically go to the library and get so that you can read material for the course. And as I've said in my, as I said, in my, one of my videos, the, uh, one of the things that you run into when you're a college student is that there's usually so much demand for the books in the various courses that the, that are on the, that are in bibliographies that very often uh, libraries will keep reference copies of those books so that, for example, let's say Sherry Bates went to the RCC library and found that all the lending copies of the books that are on her bibliography were taken out. She could then go to the reference department and they would have a copy, you know, that you could read in the library and you could take notes and so forth. And that was just something that was very common if you were a college, college student back in the 1960s. You have to remember that in the 1960s, I entered Pitt as a freshman in 1969. There was, there was no such thing as computers in, well, there weren't computers in business offices back then. You didn't have computers in libraries. What you had, if you had a bibliography, is you would go to the library with the bibliography. Again, the bibliography was a list of books that the teacher would hand out, usually at the beginning of a course, that pertained to the material in the course. And then you would go to the library, you would open, you know, you would go to the card catalog, you would pull the drawers out, you would look up the name of the, either the title of the book or the, um, you know, the name of the author, and you would find where the book was on the shelves. And as I said, if there wasn't a lending copy available, you would have to get like a reference copy, which then would require you to be in the library. Okay, so so let's turn the question around on you, uh, uh, Ray. What, what evidence do you have that Sherry's the Zodiac? Well, to begin with, uh, you didn't see, you know, I, st I became interested in serial murder cases back in the 1970s when the Son of Sam case was going on. And this was, you know, I had heard about the Zodiac Killer, but the Zodiac Killer had only been mentioned on, like, national news. I think, well, I think you can go on YouTube and find, like, um, you, you can find, uh, like, you know, brief little snippets of a minute or two where Walter Cronkite is talking about, you know, San Francisco Zodiac Killer was heard from today um, along those lines. But there wasn't, there hadn't been a book out about the Zodiac Killer until, until Robert Graysmith published his book in uh, 1986 with uh, St. Martin's Press. <clears throat> but um, uh, the reason I became interested in serial killers is that Son of Sam was, well, he wasn't just killing people, he was like leaving letters with the letters to police and letters to the newspapers with the bodies. I don't know. I'm not sure if he ever actually mailed any of his letters. I think he just left them at the scenes of the crimes. But, um, and they I found them. I don't think Son of they... Sam left any letters at scene of the crimes, right? What? I, think he, I think he mailed all of them. I, I, I don't think, I don't think. Are Berkowitz you sure about that? Almost 100%. I've interviewed Carl DeNaro, Manny Grossman. I have a whole Son of Sam series. On well, the then they were mailed then, but I, I could have sworn he left at least one letter with a body. I know, I know they found another letter in his car when they were arresting him. Yeah, but in yeah, any that, that, case, the idea that a serial killer would be communicating with the police through a letter just, uh, you know, blew me away. So that was that was part of the interest in the in the case. And if you consider that there were only a handful of cases like that, and that was true of the Riverside killer, and it was true of uh, it was true of the Zodiac killer. And, you know, as I think a lot of people look, I mean, if you look at, I just mentioned Graysmith's book, who does Graysmith talk about in his, in his book after he talks about the canonical crimes, he talks about the Sherry Bates murder. And he has, if you watch the David Fincher movie, he has um, Mark Ruffalo is playing Dave Toskey and he goes to Riverside at one point. And Riverside is telling him, we don't think this is a uh, Zodiac uh, crime. And and uh, Mark Ruffalo looks at them and says, you don't think this is Zodiac, you know? So, I mean, these, I think the similarities of tone and um, the, the, and the, the, you know, the whole thing about Bob Barnett is a joke, okay? Anyone who believes that Bob Barnett um, 
murdered Sherry Bates, he's been eliminated by fingerprints. He's been eliminated by mitochondrial, mitochondrial DNA, okay? So how is he still considered a suspect? I, you know, I just, I don't get it. It's because they don't have anything else. That's basically what it is. And what ended up happening was in uh, October 20th, 1969, Riverside PD, uh, Chief Kincaid, I believe, of Riverside PD sent a letter to the Napa Sheriff's Office, copied to other agencies, and said, we have a, a uh, homicide investigation that is very similar to your Zodiac investigation. All you have to do is go on uh, Tom Voigt's website, go to the Sherry Bates section under the victims, and click on uh, the Riverside Police Memo. And Riverside PD is talking about how similar the Sherry Bates case is to the Zodiac cases, okay? And you might ask, well, then what turned them off from that? Well, what turned them off is, if you read the memo, what was pending at the time that um, the, the memo was sent was a comparison of fingerprints between what was left on Sherry Bates's car and what was left that uh, I'm assuming they used the Presidio Heights prints in, um, in uh, San Francisco. And you have to assume that when the FBI lab, which had copies of both prints, compared those prints, they found them to be mutually exclusive. And the moment that happened, Riverside PD said, well, we know the Zodiac is one person, and we know that the whoever killed Sherry Bates was one person. Therefore, she, uh, the Sherry Bates killer can't be the Zodiac, and that's why they've been so adamant since you know since basically since 1969 that uh, that uh, the Sherry Bates's killer is not the Zodiac. But all that means is if the Zodiac was one person and Sherry Bates was killed by one person. Obviously, that eliminates uh, any connection. But if the Zodiac was more than one person, then obviously it doesn't uh, eliminate. I believe the prints that were left in Riverside are you pens, okay? And I've I've engaged in efforts to get a hold of you pens fingerprints over the past whatever it's been now twenty years now. Unfortunately, if the California DOJ ever had, if they had prints of their agents on file, um, they might have been done away with, uh, you know, by the computerization of, of everything. So uh, they may not exist anywhere. So you believe those are ba those are U-Pens prints based on I believe the prints in Riverside are U-Pens by a process what? of elimination. There were four people. Uh, I believe 85% of the time they can tell whether a, a set of prints are male or female. So that would probably eliminate Berta Margulies. Gareth Penn was at Fort Sill in Oklahoma during the, the uh, Sherry Bates murder. So that uh, eliminates it down to you, Penn. So did he have uh, automotive knowledge? What I, I'm still failing to see. You wouldn't need much automotive knowledge to disable her car. You just open up the, the back of the uh, VW and pull the wire out. I mean, how much automotive knowledge would you need? I got you. I, I don't want to uh, get too bogged down on Riverside. Let's let's go over to uh, Lake Herman Road. Um, and then I think Rich and I most likely have a, have a disagreement with you here, Ray. I believe you are a proponent of the abduction theory <laughs> that uh, David- Also in Riverside. In, well, in both Riverside, places. You, you, you have an argument, but I feel you have significantly less of an argument at Lake Herman Road. Well, uh, that's are, are, true. I would I would say, if anything, I would say the abduction argument is a slam dunk in Riverside because you have so many things that point to it. The fact that they did the library reenactment and nobody remembers seeing Sherry Bates, the fact that he, she had too much in her stomach, the fact that her car was left in his state, that her fiance said she would never have left it. So it seems to me, it seems as if she didn't leave her car voluntarily. So, out, Ray. Not a slam dunk, not a slam dunk. The Mexican-American uh, uh, student uh, identified her writing in a spiral bound notebook, so she was seen inside the library. Outside the library. Uh, in the anyway. outside the quad building at 530. That was before she drove back to her house. 
Yeah, it, it, it's possible. But so, so there are some inconsistencies with the Lake Herman Road timeline. I'll get, I'll give you that much. There's definitely some inconsistency there. However, I feel like you kind of jumped the shark with the whole they're tied up in the pump house. Uh, Richard, are you, are you familiar with this? I never thing? said I mean, they were you, tied up in the pump house. <laughs> Okay. Okay. Just then, refresh us your your Lake Herman Road. You know, I've been Richard following Richard. I've been following the case now since 1985. I still don't know what that pump house, what the um, what the uh, uh, station, the water station looks like. Okay, I've okay. never seen a picture of it. Maybe maybe Richard knows where there is one. Uh, <laughs> so re refresh us on your on your Lake Herman Road t timeline, uh, Ray, and then we'll have. Richard I'm not going to go through the whole timeline. I assume you had a problem somewhere with the timeline. Well, why don't you tell me what you had a problem with? My problem w was on Tapa Talk. You said that they were tied up in the pump house, and that the I Zodiac never said ab where abducted them. You said the Zodiac. No, I said they them. were kept in a holding area. I never said yeah, they that, were tied that. up anywhere. Richard, come on, this is not Zodiac is only on site at Lake Herman Road for what? 10 minutes richard so how are they tied up in this location ray it doesn't it doesn't make any sense it's, well they were obviously they were there from i'm guessing from about nine o'clock until the murders which took place between 11 10 11 15 okay and we know that there was a white chevy impala parked roughly between about maybe a bit after it chased uh william crow off the road it was parked in the turnout roughly between, let's say, 9.50 or so and about 10.30. So they were there for about 40 minutes. And that car was there with no one, nobody inside. It was basically a car that was parked out in the middle of nowhere and in pitch darkness. You, can't, you cannot adequately get an idea of how dark it is out on Lake Herman Road until you've been in like a complete pitch darkness situation where you literally can't see your hand in front of your face, okay? So when Frank Gasser shown came out through gate number 10 or came out through the brush and saw the white Chevy Impala there and shown his flashlight into it, the first thought he had was, what's somebody doing parked out here in the middle of nowhere? And this car's here with uh, no one inside it, okay? So from that, I assume that uh, they were keeping the kids maybe about 50 yards to the east. It couldn't have been 50 yards to the west because there, there's a hillside there. So I'm assuming it was about 50 yards to the east, which had, there was a flat field there, and they could have kept a couple of cars there uh, just pulled up into the field. And once you're a few yards off the uh, road, you're basically invisible in that, in that circumstance. Richard? Please respond. Help me out here. What, what do you think about this Lake Herman Road thing? What about uh, the abduction? Well, Ray, Ray thinks um, the couple were abducted, abducted at Blue Rock Springs. And he's basing this on the fact that Sharon Henslin in 2002 on Tom's forum. We're not sure exactly that they were going to go to. Blue Rock Springs. Some think that she never, but this is something she never mentioned when it was critical for police to know this information at the time, considering a couple had got murdered. She decided to hold on to this information and leave it till 2002, nearly three decades later. And this is where you're basing your information of an abduction on. Well, not really. Um... First of all, as far as Sharon Henslin goes, well, Sharon Henslin. Point, what? What? Sharon Henslin. I said you said, can't base it on forum post. No, Richard, I understand what you're saying. It's not a bad point, okay? But here's the problem. Sharon Henslin said that when they when the kids were brought in by SCSO, they were sat down in the interrogation room. And the cops came in and got up close to their faces and started yelling at them because because of the violence of the attack, the police were positive that there had to be drugs involved. Now, in 1968, I can tell you, having been, I am David's age, David was born October 2nd, 1951, which, is, which coincidentally is the same date that Sting of the Police was born. 
I was born April 29th, 1951. So we would have been the same class if I had gone. I was at Taylor Alderdice in Pittsburgh. Kids at that time, if you were on drugs, you were there was no such thing as cocaine, basically. I mean, there was, I'm sure cocaine existed, but people weren't uh, taking it recreationally. So if you're if you're doing recreational drugs, basically what you were doing is smoking marijuana. Okay, so that's what we're talking about. And if you listen to Thomas Horan, there is some kind of like wild, uh, you know, wild west um, uh, drug dealing going on, like similar to what you see in No Country for Old Men, you know. And there was nothing like that back, at least in maybe. Vallejo, California was radically different from what we had in Pittsburgh, but I doubt it. I mean, if you were doing drugs, what you did was you smoked marijuana, okay? And that was, it wasn't that big a deal. And when Pierre Bedeau at the beginning of the, the, the this is the Zodiac speaking documentary, is talking about crime in the area, he describes Vallejo as a sleepy little town, okay? And, and uh, Russ Butterback said, you know, we didn't really have any murders. And the few murders that we had, we didn't have any trouble uh, solving until this one happened. OK, so this was such a culture shock, I think, to Solano County Sheriff's Office that they, you know, they brought the Sharon and her friends in and just like yelled at them. And I think what ended up happening was that that discouraged Sharon from talking about, well, you know, David was going to go to Blue Rock Springs Park. And the fact is she may have told the cops that and the cops may not have listened to her. What do you think? But also, can I add something? Go ahead. Well, when when they when when Betty Lou Jensen left Sharon Hensling's house it was a very cold night, as you know. I know you're disputing the temperature that night, but it was no, still well, cold. It's, I when think we can agree it was somewhere between well, 22 on. and 32. Go ahead. Well, I'm sorry, Richard. It was Go cold. Ahead. She was wearing a white fur coat. Yeah, it was cold. She was wearing a white. She was wearing a white fur fur coat. If they went to Blue Rock Springs and got abducted, and and stuck in the boot, at what point was her coat then removed and put on the back seat of the Rambler. That is uh, inconsistent by, with any kidnapping. By boot, you Correct. mean the car. Is that what you're talking about? Is that that's English slang for a car? She was Sorry. I, the boot? Yeah. Yes. That uh, means, uh, I'm just asking you, that means trunk. the car, right? Yeah. It means trunk. Okay, yeah. The, the fur coat was found on the back seat of the, of the car, and if you're the Zodiacs and you're trying to set up this scenario so where, how come? what? Well, you're the Zodiacs. You're trying to set up the scenario where the kids were actually inside the car necking. So what they do after they kill the two kids is they take the the uh, they turn the the car engine on, they turn the heater on, they re they recline the uh, front seat to 45 degrees or whatever it was. And they put her fur coat in the back in the back seat just to make it look like, well, it was getting warm, and she took the fur coat off because they were inside the car necking, you know. So I mean, I don't, I don't see the fur coat as being any like major piece of evidence there because it could have been there for almost any reason. How about forensics? That, Ray? You're, that you're, claim is speculation. You can't prove any of that. What? I'm sorry, Richard. I didn't. I hear said you. the argument. You've said the argument about the fur coat. All you've said there is just speculation. The same with Sharon Henslin and how the police approached interviewing her. Well, you don't know any of this. This is just thing. speculation. Okay, Richard Grinnell went on his. Uh, Richard Grinnell went on his website, and he called the scenario that I that I give about the holding area and so forth in my book. <clears throat> He called it uh, fiction, okay? Here's the thing. If you're a prosecutor and you're going to, you're taking somebody to trial, this is true of every single criminal case, mm. is you are, you have to walk the jury 
through whatever scenario you're putting forward, okay? In other words, we have the defendant, we believe the defendant shot, you know, Joe Blow, okay? We believe he took his gun, he bought his gun at the hardware store, he went down to his, um, went down to his uh, ex-friend's house, knocked on the door, his friend came to the door, he shot the guy, then he got into his car and he drove 50 miles away to make it look like he was someplace else. In other words, if you're a prosecutor, it isn't enough just to present forensics, okay? Ross just mentioned forensics. Even if you have DNA on somebody, if you have um, fingerprints, DNA, you have like hard evidence, you still have to put it in, into some sort of circumstantial framework, okay? And that's what a case theory does, okay? So it's not an attempt to create some kind of a fictional narrative. It's just a scenario where you're walking the jury through what actually happened. Okay, here's what I think happened on Lake Herman Road. And that's all I'm doing. And what, here's what you have to remember. If you, if you actually go to the trouble of, here's the thing, I sent Richard uh, yeah, I know where Richard lives because Richard, back when we were, you know, when I was uh, posting on Richard's uh, site all the time, I had sent Richard um, a, uh, you know, ebook copies of my books. And he said something like, you know, it'd be nice to have a physical copy of the book. So I said, well, give me your address and I will send you physical copies of your book. Okay. So I end up actually sending uh, copies of, of, of my, my books to, uh, to his address there in Coventry. Okay. So, so in, in my book, what I'm presenting is a scenario. Okay. I'm presenting, I'm looking at the evidence and I'm telling you what I think, but if you actually go to the Wayback machine and you go to, um, uh, the web archive, and you look up what was the closest, probably the closest thing to my 1990 book, The Zodiac Murder Solved. It's the Zodiac Murder Solved.com on the web archive. And my original book, I don't have anything about the actual crimes. The original book was just about the conceptual art angle of, you know, here are the four zodiacs. Here's why I think here's what I think they were doing as far as the conceptual art goes. But in you will find nowhere on that website any point where I'm saying, here's what I think happened in Riverside. Here's what I think happened on Lake Herman Road. Okay. So the accusation that Richard made that I was trying to retrofit my analysis of the evidence to what I already believed isn't true because. I didn't start working on the analysis of the crime scenes until I was online, which was which didn't happen until 2010. And people, for example, on Mike Butterfield's forum were attacking me because I didn't have a lot of knowledge as to the, or, the original crimes. But the only reason for that is that I made a lot of the assumptions that uh, Ross is making, which is I assumed that the confession letter in Riverside is what happened. I assume that the the consensus um, the the consensus story about what happened to David Faraday and Betty Lou Jensen was what actually happened. You know, I I was sure that Michael O'Hare was the Zodiac killer, but again, I just assumed that he pulled into the turnout at eleven ten or what have you, shot them. I didn't make any of these assumptions that we're talking about where I created the holding area or in uh, Riverside where I had uh, Sherry abducted. It wasn't until I started looking at the evidence that I started to think that. And again, let me underscore something, which is if I could go on, on Ross's, um, on Ross's uh, channel here and just say, you know what? I think Sherry Bates showed up at the, at the library that night and she charged out books and then she left and she was attacked later on. If I could just do that, I would, because I it would save me a lot of grief. I wouldn't have to do all of this explaining to people. Yeah, it's, and it's, I, it's, I would still have my conceptual art angle. The problem is, once I started looking at the actual evidence, I said, 
I don't think Sherry was ever in the RCC library. And I also said when I looked at um, Lake Herman Road, I don't think the kids ever actually voluntarily drove to the turnout. I think they were taken there. Okay, so I I, I don't know, Ray. I mean, there's 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 some some issues with it. Like you know, like what the evidence shows though is that Zodiac only pulled up briefly and only spent a brief amount of time there at Lake Herman Road. So you can have your own <coughs> conception of it, but the thing is, looking at the police files and all of the other sources, none of us have ever heard this angle except for you. So, like, you're kind of confounding with your entire case theory that you have these four suspects and it fits together nicely in this conceptual art theory, which relates back to a, 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 a shooting at the MIT Tower 7 and these pre-planned Massachusetts crimes. I don't know if you know this, Ray, but I'm from Massachusetts. I spent, I, I worked in Cambridge for 10 years and I've never heard of a MIT or Massachusetts connection to the Zodiac, you know, except for in, in your theory. So what I'm wondering, you know, looking at the correspondence and, and all the research. They probably uh, never heard of Ross either. <laughs> okay, well, looking at the correspondence and, and all the research you've done, Richard, have you ever seen anything that relates these canonical crimes to, to, to anything back to Massachusetts? And what I mean is looking at these, uh, do you have handwriting examples for, for, from your suspects? I mean, I'm sure I, I've never read Time 17, Rich, but like what what is your take on the whole Gareth Penn, uh, you know, O'Hare thing? No, nothing, Are any of these suspects viable, Rich? There's nothing wrong in there's nothing wrong in thinking and speculating. There is actually no evidence whatsoever that any of these four suspects can be placed anywhere near any crime scene. And I've got nothing wrong with Ray Grant speculating on these things. But in a recent video, he said, I don't listen to other researchers anymore. And that's because I'm 100% correct. Well, Ray admits that years ago that he changed his mind about Donald Falk on uh, Jackson Street so he knows that by listening to other researchers, he can have his mind changed. But I remember in 2015 when Ray sent me the book and he, and he left saying I insulted him and he was never, ever going to return or visit my, web, visit my website ever again. My point being, if you don't listen to other researchers, you may not agree with them 90% of the time, but there might be certain nuggets as Ray picked up with Donald Falk at Jackson Street that might change your mind and might advance the case for you. So I think it's always important listening to other researchers, no matter how much you disagree with them. And nobody can claim they're 100% know what happened. That's absolutely impossible. Even I wouldn't claim that. When did I ever claim that? In that point of fact, and Richard knows this, I give him credit for the Jackson Street material all the time. How many times have you seen me credit you on other websites no, and message do. boards about that? Well, I'm glad we can I'm agree good. on something. I know. Here, here's the you problem, said that. Ray. Here's the, here's the problem, Ray. You've credited me Richard about Lake Herman Road as well. About the... I've, I've, I've given him credit. No, Ray has credit. He, he didn't have a bigger supporter than me because he started out with an evidence based website. And I supported him. I've cited him numerous times on other on other boards, and at no time have I ever said that I'm 100% correct. I can be wrong about uh, details. I've been corrected on details by Richard. I've been I've had second thoughts about details. I recently changed my opinion about who was right on Lake Herman Road. It was between Peggy Ewer the positioning of the car by Peggy Ewer or by uh, Robert Conley. And I decided after, while I was doing my video series that I thought, well, wait a minute. I think Robert Conley is probably correct here about where the car was, where, where he said that the car was to the right side of the turnout. So, I mean, the idea that I, that, that I think I'm 100%, no one is 100%. This is the most complex serial case in history. And nobody, I don't know of any long-term researchers who are who are close to being 100%. We all make mistakes about the case. Yeah, here's my problem, Ray. It's And why did you say it? <laughs> when did I say I was 100% correct? Show me where I said what's, that. What's your research? 
I can go and replay one of your videos for you if I have the time. Don't forget, I'll watch uh, your videos. I'll tell you, you what, you do I'm that. You replay one of my no, videos and then come back to me. Give me a video and I'll give me a you. timing on the video, okay? We need a timestamp. I never can said I, I'm 100% one more correct. Can I, can I put you straight on something else, Ray? Get him, Rich. Do you, do you want to give Jarrett Kobeck some uh, credit for sending me the police files that show Stanley Dean Baker's fingerprints at the crime scene of Robert Salem? I asked, I challenged a reporter for USA Today back in 1990 about, he said that there were, he said exactly what you're telling me now, which is that they had uh, fingerprints for Stanley Dean Baker at the Robert Salem crime scene. And I said, fine, why didn't, why wasn't he charged then? If I have fingerprints and wow. blood at a crime scene, what? Go ahead. I was going to say, if you read, if you actually read the police report that's actually on my site with all the photographs and everything, you'll realize why. Well, tell me. <laughs> well, I'll let you find it. Just type it in um, afterwards. I can't remember the exact wording. Uh, like I said, there but was a there. reporter. I, I, I'm like you. There was a reporter for USA Today who told me that he said they have his fingerprints over the. He, they have his fingerprints at the crime scene, and I said, "Fine." I said, "Explain to me then why he was never charged," and. That was the end of the conversation. If you have somebody's fingerprints well, like you, blood at a crime scene, you've got that person. I didn't say it was in blood. But anyway, what I would say is, like you, I agreed with you that Robert Salem was one of the most promising uh, outliers in the Zodiac case. And I wrote about nine or ten articles in a row virtually on Robert Salem. And I was very interested in it until Jarrett Kobeck sent me this thing and it pretty much destroyed everything I'd been working on. But I didn't stick with it. I got rid of it. And now I realize I was wrong. But well, you've done a video on it. So. So the fact that I did a video on Robert Salem means that I believe I'm 100% correct. Okay. No, I didn't say that, did I? <laughs> well, that's the example I said. Give me an example of my saying that I was 100% correct. And he mentions the Robert Salem oh, video. Let, let me, let me, let me. No, I didn't mean it. Here. <laughs> Robert Salem video. Anyway, carry on. Go on. Yeah, no, so here, yeah, uh, turning that around. So, uh, Ray, on that exact concept, if they have partial fingerprints at Presidio Heights to your, your suspect, why don't you have a smoking gun? Here's my problem with your theory. You have the four, you have the letter writer, the cipher cryptographer, the gunman, and the promotional person who I guess right. you said was, was, was Penn. But here's the problem. How did Tashi and Armstrong mi miss this, Ray? If you have a 100% smoking gun, why can't you just send your book to the FBI right now and just have the whole thing be solved? That's my whole thing that's driving me crazy on your theory. Uh, I don't have access to for it. You know, I'm like, I'm an amateur researcher, just like uh, you are, just like um, Richard is. And I don't have access to forensic uh, information. So I have no way that, of going to the police. That, that's not why I'm saying, though. Why can't you just notify law enforcement? Well, I've been theory? doing that since 1990. I mean, the police. How, why got... haven't they responded since 1990, Ray? That's 30 well, years. Hey, hey uh, Ross, just because the police don't respond don't doesn't mean you're wrong. Yeah, but it also doesn't mean they're listening to you because in 40, 50 years, they wouldn't use Ray Grant's tip to solve the greatest American cold case of all time. Have like you ever Central? tried contacting a police agency? Several have times. You ever talk, have you interviewed Mike Morford? Ask Mike Morford about contacting police agencies and how uh, frustrating it is. I mean, I'm, you, you, I'm, I'm pretty sure he got a response on Mac, didn't he? So what's your Well, I've gotten there? responses from police agencies. I've talked to... Would you like to enlighten us on what it was? To the police agency? Let's see. I've talked to... 
In 1990, I talked to Fred Shirasego, who is the head of the um, California DOJ Zodiac Killer Investigation. In 91, I talked to Captain Roy Conway of Vallejo <coughs> PD and uh, Detective George Baywart of Vallejo, the late George uh, Baywart. Uh, they were both convinced. Uh, what Roy Conway said to me was, he said, you believe Sherry Bates is a Zodiac victim, and we know. No, he didn't name the um, suspect at the time, but he was talking about uh, Bob Barnett. And he said, we know for sure that our suspect uh, killed Sherry Bates. So since you're wrong about that, we didn't bother to, to read the rest of your book. Now, as I said, Bob Barnett's fingerprints don't match what was left at the Sherry Bates crime scene. And uh, his mitochondrial DNA doesn't match what was in uh, what was in the um, the the mitochondrial right, 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 DNA right, right. of the let's, hair. Let's stay on topic. I I mean, in respect to your suspect, like why they, they came back to you and said, "Oh yeah, it's Penn, it's Penn and O'Hare. You nailed this, Ray." Did, did, did anybody anybody tell you that from from law enforcement? So if I so if anybody goes to law enforcement and they say, "I think so and so." Uh, commit a murder. I can give you examples of uh, the Mark Winger case. One of the junior detectives in the Mark Winger case thought that Winger killed his wife and he killed uh, the the guy who came to his front door. And the rest of the city, they were giving him, you know, front page, uh, 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 you know, stories about what a hero he was, that uh, this guy came to his front door and killed his wife. And the junior detective on the case said, you know, I think Winger actually killed his wife and he and then he killed the guy who came to the front door and he blamed the guy who came to the front door for doing that. And the chief of police of uh, look up Mark Winger on Wikipedia, the chief of police in the uh, department said, shut up. We've already solved the case. We don't want to hear what your opinion was. And it wasn't until a year later that. Um, the girlfriend of Mark Winger came forward and said this guy wanted to kill his wife, that they were then willing to listen to their own junior detectives. So, I mean, people have opinions about cold cases that the police don't necessarily listen to. And if the police don't listen to your opinion on a cold case, that doesn't necessarily mean that you're wrong. And it's particularly uh, okay. true. I'll give you an example. Ross. I will give you the outstanding example of all outstanding examples of that. Ted Kaczynski. The only reason Ted Kaczynski was incarcerated and that we know who the Unabomber was is that two members of the FBI task force insisted on getting a search warrant for Ted Kaczynski's cabin. The rest of the FBI task force disowned that search warrant. In fact, you can go online now and look up. I don't know. I was I was reading it myself, like maybe a year T or two time ago. Time out, Ray. Time out, Ray. I got to get us back on topic here. So, so like, here's here's the problem. But the, like, what I'm getting at is the entire FBI task force, except for two of the agents, thought that the FBI was wasting its time by investigating Ted Kaczynski. Okay. And I understand. I understand. But the only wait a minute, Ross. Case, like it's not Ross. Ongoing, wait. Wait one know? second. One second. The only reason they ended up going after Ted Kaczynski, and the only reason those two agents believe that Kaczynski might be the Unabomber, is that he lived in a cabin in the woods. They thought he was weird enough. This guy may just be wacky enough that he may be doing this stuff on the side. If Kaczynski had still been on the Cal Berkeley math faculty, they would never have investigated him. And that's despite the fact that he was turned in by his sister-in-law and by his brother, okay? So this whole idea about, well, if the police aren't investigating what, you know, your suspect, your suspect must be wrong. Now, sometimes, first of all, the police are getting tips all the time about who the Zodiac killer is, okay? And that was true even like 30 years ago. So whether the police are going to take you seriously or not, um, you know, that doesn't necessarily mean that you're wrong. Okay, great point. But it's not just the police, Ray. It's the FBI. It's two separate police jur jurisdictions. There's all these 
separate bodies if anyone found like you're essentially saying because o'hare was on the faculty of a school board that he would he would not be investigated you know if there i, I don't really think anyone's profession at this point or any of that thing would have discounted them if they felt like kind of like what rich was saying they found any sort of forensics any sort of handwriting cipher uh history anything that would relate him back to being the zodiac at, at this point it would have came up so let's let's uh, go I back you're to, wrong about that i i don't see how Let, let's go back to uh B blue rock springs ray why don't you why don't you walk us through uh blue rock no springs? i'll tell you what you and richard have been ganging up on me for how long is it now for uh when do we start? For an hour. Okay. 55 minutes. Let me, yeah. Well, let me turn the tables on you. I want you to walk me through the, uh, on Lake Herman Road, I want you to walk me through a case theory, a scenario for a generic Zodiac. Okay. I'm not saying find me who the Zodiac killer is. I'm saying give me times. Give me venues. Give me ways to ways to get to the crime scene uh, for a generic Zodiac, okay? And let me let me uh, spoil the suspense for you leading in here. You're not going to be able to do it because I've been asking guys like you for the last 30 years. Let's see your case theory. You don't have one. I'll tell you what. As in just reading the regular police port that already has no. the, the time set? No, so, no, 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 so no, no. Richard doesn't I want like you me. to walk me through what the Zodiac Killer did. We're going to start at 9 p.m. That's the last time we saw the teenagers. They drive away from Sharon Enzelin's house. Go ahead, Richard. I can't wait to hear what your next uh, entry is. You like that one, Richard? Nothing well, you know so far. You're going to do. You're going to dispute the Hogan High School Christmas concert target, even though Brent you admit it's in the police report. That's where they were at 9 p.m. Okay, where'd they go after that? I said, I just said they went to Hogan High, didn't they? They didn't go to Hogan High. No, it's because in the you police, had one report. police report. There was no Christmas concert at Hogan High that night. But there's Look also at the police, in the report. police report. What? There's, I just said there's also statements in the police report that suggest that they went to Hogan High on multiple occasions, as there was in the newspapers, as you saw, even with Les Lumblad. Jesus, Mary and Joseph. Well, all right, let's assume How they didn't go to Hogan High. How many times do you have to be disproved? Before you will, before you will concede that you're wrong, how many times? The only reason that you see any mention whatsoever of Hogan High in the original newspaper accounts is because that's what the kids told um, Betty Lou's parents. Okay, and I will concede that for some reason, David and Betty Lou said that they were going to a Christmas Christmas concert that night. There's a guy who posts on Reddit, used to post on Tom's board. He calls himself VT Esquire, okay? Used to be a big fan of uh -huh. Richards. All of a sudden, he's not a fan of Richards anymore. In fact, the last no, time he, he posted, him. what's that? He's always hated everything I've done. He's like Tom Boyd. No, he hasn't. He, he, he agreed with you about Hogan High. And now he, now he uh -huh. comes out and he says, don't read anything on Richard's, which I would never say. But he says, don't read anything on Richard Grinnell's uh, website because it's all BS, basically. Look, um, Todd the Plumber, as I like to call him, VT Esquire, says that the actual Christmas concert took place on December 13th, 1968, not December 20th. Okay. And December 13th was... One day before David Faraday and Betty Lou even met, they didn't meet until December 14th. So they couldn't have been at the concert together a week earlier or a week right. later or anything else. Okay. They so never, they were never anywhere Reddit near guy. Hogan right. High that night. Period. You, you that off a, a random right, let's take, no, it's let's what take, it says I'm in on. the police let's report, take. Ross. Ross. 
Read the police report. That's what it says. There was no concert at Hogan High that night. Okay. You just told okay. me it's a Redditor, but okay. Take Hogan what? High out. Hang on. Take Hogan High out. Take Hogan High out the equation then, right? They left Sharon right. Hensley's house at nine o'clock. The next Go ahead. police report that you disagree with is Helen Axe at 10.15. No. Go ahead. I know ahead. you don't believe it... her statement. Well, right. I will. So I will. Be... I don't know. If, if, Richard. Hold, I'm going to give you the Richard, listen if to me for a if... second. Rich. Hang Rich. on. Listen to me for one second, okay? What we are doing right now is argument, okay? You are making a point. I'm going to respond to the point, I'm okay? Not... Yeah, go ahead. There has to be a question. Go right. ahead. Yeah. We both yeah, agree that right. they left Sharon... I'm just... We both agree they left Sharon Hensley's house at nine, yes? Right. We both agree... That there is a police report of Helen Axe seeing what they believe to be the Rambler at 10.15. Let's take Hogan High out the equation for a second. Right. I don't have a clue where they were for those right. 10 15 minutes, and neither do you. You don't know they went to Blue Rock Springs. You don't know they were abducted. There's no evidence of an abduction. So I don't know where they were for those one hour and 15 minutes any, any more than you do. All right, let me tell you what Is that I fair think. Enough? No, that's perfect. That's fine. That's the old Richard. That's the fine, Richard right. Grinnell that I love, that I used to go to his website to listen to. That is Mr. Evidence. Okay. I still go to it. Well, hey, hey, I support I was supporting this guy before you even knew who he was, Ross. Okay. Here's Ooh. the thing. It was an evidence-based website. That's what's great about it. Okay. Here's the thing. We have these two times, 10.15 p.m. and 10.30 p.m., okay? She says she, she passed. She was riding in the car going east at 10.15 p.m. when she, when she originally passed the uh, turnout. And they came back from the east, driving west now, and they passed the turnout at about 10.30 p.m. When she talks to the police, she says, she says the car was facing out. And then apparently SCSO said something to the effect of, well, wait a minute. All the other witnesses say that the car in the turnout was facing in. And Helen Axe then says, well, you'd have to talk to my sailor boyfriend who is driving the car, which means that she wasn't looking both times, okay? So then I assume that the correct time when she actually saw the car facing out was 10.30 p.m. Okay, is that reasonable? Richard? Well, there was a discrepancy from the 10... There was a discrepancy from 10.15 to 10.30. But doesn't uh, 10.30 then make more the sense? Vehicle position, I, was I was facing out. Suggest... Well, I was about to say, if they arrived at 10.15 and then briefly afterwards, Helen Axe went past with her boyfriend, saw the Rambler, went to the bottom of the road, came back up, and then they'd settled in their position at that point. It's understandable that a vehicle would have been in two different positions, which might be suggestive of the time when they did arrive in the turnout at 10.15. That's all I would say on that. But I don't know. I mean, you don't want to believe yeah, no, that Helen no Axe saw the sure. Rambler, do you? You, want to believe, you, you, want, well, you think it was the, the reason... white Chevrolet, if I'm not mistaken. The reason I don't believe that Helen Axe saw the Rambler is, as, I, as you know, I believe that uh, all three uh, witnesses, um, Bingo Wesner, Robert Conley, and Frank Gasser, all arrived on the road or basically arrived uh, by the turnout. Bingo was coming out of the gate. Um, Robert Conley and Frank Gasser were driving by in the red pickup at 10 p.m. And you have said that you believe that they they drove by there at 9, that uh, Conley arrived on the road at 9 p.m. And I'm saying I don't think that's yeah. possible. I think 10 p.m. makes a lot more sense. And the reason to believe that it wasn't 10, 15 p.m. is that, again, there was a, uh, first of all, you have Bingo and Robert both saying they saw the white Chevy Impala at 10 p.m., facing in towards the south fence 
And then at some point, let's say 10, 15 or 10, 20 p.m., Frank Gasser comes out of the brush and shines his flashlight again into a white Chevy Impala, okay? So the only problem, again, to underscore this, the only dispute on this point between Richard Grinnell and myself is the identification of the car. Uh, Richard says that, that it was the Faraday Rambler, and I say it was the white Chevy Impala. And the reason I say it's the white Chevy Impala is that that's what the other witnesses saw. Um, Halinak right, said it was of... Rambler. Sorry, Rich. Who? Helen Axe said it was the Helen Axe right. said it was the Rambler. I didn't say it was. I'm going well, on no, that in the same way that Robert Connolly. Robert Connolly said the Rambler was on the West Bank. Do you believe that? I believe. Well, now we're talking about uh, like five minutes after eleven or so. And yes, I have now changed my mind about because I have basically thrown out Peggy Ewer's testimony totally. And I now believe that uh, Robert Conley was correct. And what happened was that the Zodiacs were driving the, the um, Rambler back into the turnout circa 11 o'clock, uh, 11 well, 11.05, I guess. And uh, that's what he saw. In other words, whoever was driving the the uh, Rambler looked down the hill, saw that the hunters were coming out of the Marshall Ranch turnout, pulled in, stopped the car, you know, maybe shut the engine off. And as Robert Conley drove up the hill and drove past the turnout, he saw the Rambler on the right side of the turnout. And that would explain why the Rambler was why Robert Conley insisted that he saw it on the right side of the turnout, which would have been the western side of the turnout. And then when James Owen came by a few minutes later, it was actually parked uh, facing east. Yeah, I mean, um, if you believe in the one Zodiac theory, obviously I do. What a lot of people Same. don't pay attention to is the police report. And the last time that anybody saw that Rambler in the turnout before James Owen saw two vehicles was Robert Conley, who saw it on the West Bank. So it's more logical to conclude that when Zodiac arrived, it was on the West and it was shifted over to the East Bank or, as I say, closer, just past the middle. That's the logical conclusion. Yeah, I agree with you. And you said people will stick with things they've believed for 50 years that the Zodiac rolled along, pulled up to the right side of the Rambler, got out and started firing. Well, the last position the Rambler was seen before two vehicles were seen in the turnout was on the West Bank. So it's more logical to conclude that Zodiac arrived when the Rambler was on the West Bank and somehow was shifted. You don't agree with the single Zodiac theory so that wouldn't apply to your uh scenario would it well i just before we go any anywhere else i just want to say something to ross ross you know there's like a delay when we're talking and that what it ends up happening is we end up talking over each other and it may sound like we're you know arguing arguing ferociously but we actually aren't it's like i can't always hear him I don't know if that's fixable. I guess it probably isn't. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure. I mean, neither of you guys have headphones on, right? So that might be part of the issue. Uh, again, okay. it's, we're at the mercy of StreamYard, gentlemen. Apologize. But yeah. uh, just, just okay. give it like a second between statements to load. Yeah. All right. Um, let me Hold go on, back Ray. to... Ray, do us a favor. Can you move yourself a little bit to your left? Because when you're showing your... There you go. Your graph was cut off. Uh, okay. Other way. That way. Yeah. Good. All right, let's go, let's go back to what we were talking about before. And this is my point. Uh, I believe 1030 is a better estimate for when Helen Axe did, and I will talk about Helen Axe in a moment, okay? But here's the, you know, Richard Grinnell came back and he was talking about on your, um, uh, on, it wasn't, was it a debate series with Druzer or was it, it was just a discussion um, about, yeah, Richard Grinnell says, well, 
we don't know that the Zodiac Killer wasn't driving an ice cream van on Lake Herman Road, okay? Well, here's the thing. It's true, for example, that if you look at these two times, um, 9 p.m., 926 Brentwood Avenue, 10.30 p.m., and I can write in, let me put uh, gate number 10 turnout. You have these two times, and you have these two places here, okay? And here's here's the problem with this. Uh, Richard is right when he says that we don't know where they 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 were. He doesn't know where they are, where they were. I don't know for sure where they were. I know where I think they were, okay? But I, I can't prove it. I don't have video any more than any of us has video of an, of an ice cream band there. But the point is, they were somewhere, okay? That's the point I'm trying to make. Between 9 p.m. that night and 10.30 p.m., David Faraday and Betty Lou Jensen were somewhere, okay? So it's not like we're going to fast forward and go from 9 p.m. and then go for 10 to 10.30 p.m. and say, well, you know, okay, and the, their next sighting was at 10.30 p.m. Let's act like the 90 minutes between those times never happened. Here's the question. If you're going to do a conventional reconstruction of what, uh, of what happened on Lake Herman Road that night, and you're making the point that the teenagers were moving around under their own power, and the Zodiac Killer still has a 10.30 p.m. that's still about 40 minutes before the Zodiac Killer even shows up, correct? Okay. Then what were they doing in that 90 minutes? Because here's the thing. If you look at what David Faraday had in his hand at the end of the night, he told Sharon Henslin at 926 Brentwood Avenue, the I'm assuming the night before over the phone, that he was going to give his class ring to Betty Lou Jensen and ask her to go steady with him. At 10.30 p.m., you know, an hour and a half had gone by, so were they in a car together? Were they necking, you know? How is it that when David's body was looked at by Russ Butterback at, you know, I think he was pronounced dead at 12.05 a.m., something like that. How does he still have the ring in his hand? Okay, because if they had been necking in the car, I would have assumed, you know, I was assumed that he would have given her his ring. If they had just been talking in the car, I would have assumed he would have given her the ring. That's what he, he was an Eagle Scout. Uh, Boy Scouts, are their motto is be prepared. So I'm assuming that he was prepared, you know, to do what he wanted to do. And yet by 10.30 p.m. and by the time he was dead, he hadn't done that. Okay. So the other question is, what were they doing in that 90-minute thing, in that 90-minute uh, period where they weren't seen by anybody? And, um, you know, they had an 11 o'clock curfew. Okay. So... As I said, they had to be somewhere and they had to be doing something. And yet the evidence that, that we have is that basically they were in limbo. They were in, they were uh, David Faraday and Betty Lou Jensen for all intents and purposes. Here's the funny thing. For all intents and purposes, Richard Grinnell is correct about this. Because for all intents and purposes, the two teenagers didn't exist in that 90 minute period. Because nothing changed. At 10.30 p.m., they were in exactly the same situation that they were in at 9 p.m. David hadn't made any progress in getting her to go steady with him. And what were they doing? And the next question you're going to ask is, wherever they were for that 90-minute period, how come they were suddenly out Lake Herman Road at 10.30 p.m.? Why would they... Why would David drive out Lake Herman Road? Uh, that's a five-minute drive from the end of the road. It's okay, so he's increasing the likelihood that he's going to be late for his curfew. He knows he has an 11 o'clock curfew. And couldn't they have taken care of business wherever they were in that first 90 minutes? Okay, 
the, the point I'm trying to make here is whether we know where they were or not, they had to be somewhere. Okay, great, great point, Ray. But you know, it still feels like you're 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 pulling a gray smith and pouring a bunch of extra dressing <laughs> on the gray area when you try to fill in the gaps there. So Richard doesn't like the William Crow story, but it sounds like you do. My whole thing is you have multiple witnesses driving by reporting the positions of the of the cars. So if it's anything other than what the police reports say, which is Zodiac pulling up, shooting and driving away, you know what I mean? How come you, you, you don't have any more information from all these, these witnesses that drive by? And it doesn't really explain the, the William Crow incident either. So he's driving around looking for people to kidnap, but you know, you, you know what I'm saying? What, what, why even chase people in the car? If, if that's the case, you know, it doesn't, doesn't seem to add up in the timeline. Well, he chases people out of the turnout because they want to kill the couple in the turnout. Because okay. they're... That, that's, that's, yeah, that's reasonable. I don't mind that, that, that response. Um, let, let, let's move on to Blue Rock Springs. Can I bring something up about the curfew? Go, Go ahead. Can I quickly bring something up about the curfew? I think it was either March or May of 69 there was an interview with david faraday's mother and she stated in there that the curfew given to david at the weekend was 12 30. how do we reconcile that with the 11 o'clock stated previously that may have been her curfew the curfew that the jensen's gave him was 11 o'clock uh, gene faraday never even met Jean yeah. Faraday didn't know well, who Betty Lou was. She had never met her. Good, Rich. Mm, I'm just adding that into the equation. Well, it has nothing. One one thing has nothing to do with the other thing. Jean, whatever. Jean Faraday may have had a curfew with David that was 12:30. That's entirely possible. The curfew that the Jensens gave um, Betty Lou and David was 11 o'clock, and there was a reason for that. It's because Betty Lou's older sister, Melody Job, became pregnant because she was out in the car with somebody, I guess, in a lover's lane. And up until that evening, the Jensen's had never allowed Betty Lou to go on a date with any boys because they were afraid of history repeating itself. And uh, Melody, Mel if you read the police report, you will note that Melody Job actually went to the trouble of setting up the date. She told Betty Lou, you know, bring David over to meet our parents and, you know, just go out on a date and come back. And they, I mean, the idea of the curfew was, was intended to give David the chance to show what a good citizen he was, you know, you know, have her back by 11 o'clock. And that's the whole point of the date was, to, uh, you know, so that uh, her parents could get used to uh, to David being around. So the last thing that David wanted to happen was for him to be uh, late for the curfew. As I said, I don't know what Gene Faraday's curfew was, but it wouldn't have had anything to do with the Jensen's. And as I said, Gene didn't even know um, know who Betty who Betty Lou was. I want to uh, before we get you know, off track. I want to have a little discussion about this uh, witness that uh, Richard likes so much. <clears throat> Her name is Helen Axe, okay? Let's talk about Helen Axe before we go any further, okay? Because Helen Axe is the only witness before 11 o'clock who puts the teenagers anywhere near the uh, gate number 10 turnout. What's that? Is that coffee? Ah, uh, no, it's uh, my energy drink. I'm just plugging these mugs you guys can get on the Teespring. Get, get, oh man! Don't don't pay any attention to me. Um. Okay. So, the only person who puts the teenagers, um, in the vicinity of the gate number ten turnout prior to eleven o'clock is Helen Axe. Okay, and actually, if you eliminate Betty, if you eliminate Peggy Ewer, which I do. 
Uh, nobody saw the teenagers after they left um, Sharon Hensland's house. But let's talk about Helen Axe for a second. What's the first thing we know about Helen Axe? Helen Axe went to, called SCSO on Monday after the, um, after the murders. The murders were on Friday night. She calls SCO around right around noon on Monday. And she, she tells them that she saw the car, she saw the uh, Rambler facing out from the uh, gate number 10 turnout as she drove by. <clears throat> and apparently SCSO, whoever the responding officer was, said something along the lines of, well, wait a minute, all of our other witnesses who saw a car in the turnout said that the car was pointed in, okay? And Helen Axe then said, well, I will bring the, uh, the person who was driving the car was my sailor boyfriend, uh, and I will bring him in and uh, you can talk to him because he, he saw the turnout as he was originally driving by, presumably at 10.15 p.m. Now, uh, here's the funny thing about Helen Axe. She, Helen Axe was 18 years old when the um, Lake Herman Road murders took place. She was married in August 1965 when she was 15. She was Helen Bridges. And she married a man named Thomas F. Axe, A-X-E. And Thomas Axe, of all things, was a sailor. He was enrolled, uh, he was a sailor in the U.S. Navy, okay? So here's the question. <clears throat> uh, three and a half years later, three and four, whatever it is, three and four months later, Helen Axe is driving along uh, Lake Herman Road, okay? And she's with a driver, and when when uh, she tells the uh, SCSO that uh, about the driver of the car, she describes him as her, her sailor boyfriend. Does that sound like something a married woman would call her husband? I I had always assumed, up until somebody told me that her actual husband was a sailor, I had always assumed it was just some guy who was a sailor that she was out in the car with. Okay. And then somebody said, somebody on one of the uh, message boards said, well, she was married to this guy named Thomas Axe, and he was in the Navy, okay? So that just seems like completely bizarre to me, okay? Here's the second issue. Yeah, I'm not Helen exactly Axe. sure what we're, get, what we're getting at here, Ray. So, so Well, I'm, I'm trying to point something out to you, okay? We have the sailor boyfriend. She she calls her husband her sailor boyfriend, if it's her husband. If it's not her husband, it means three years after a marriage, she's out in the car driving along Lake Herman Road with some other sail. Okay. The second question is, why would a married woman who has a house in the area be looking to car, park a car on a, we just said it was a frozen a night when the, uh, when it was very cold out, you know, it was like a winter night. It was 22 degrees or whatever. Why is she looking for a place to park on the road? She has a house. If it's, yeah. if it's her husband, wouldn't they be in their, in her house? I mean, why is she looking for a place to park? That's two problems with Helen Axe, okay? But wait, there's more. The third problem with Helen Axe is that Helen Axe was the last witness to contact police for the Lake Herman Road murders. Everybody else had already talked to the police. Bingo Wesner talked to the police first at 8 a.m. that morning, the following morning. Um, James Owen talked to them as he was driving back from the uh, oil refinery about 8.15 p.m. Uh, if you look at the newspapers, you will notice that Les Lundblad in an interview says that as far as he could tell, the teenagers were not even on the road until about 11 p.m., okay? Because none of the witnesses had said they had seen the Rambler or had seen uh, the two teenagers there. 
It wasn't until Hellenax called them around noon on Monday that they found out that they, all of a sudden they get this information that maybe the teenagers were there earlier. And Hellenax said that uh, she saw the Rambler there. Okay. Um, why would she wait that long? She was the last witness to contact the police. Would there be a reason for her not to do that? Maybe the fact that she was out in the car with some guy who wasn't her husband? I don't know. If she was with her husband, I don't understand what she was doing. Okay? But don't... Right. So, so you're, you're questioning Helen Axe's credibility. So well, we're, here's we're something it, else to think about. You know, while we're thinking about all this other stuff, here's something else to think about. Helen Axe's sailor boyfriend, who's whose eyewitness account is critical to this whole thing. It tells us whether whether the, you know, when, when if he passed the 1015, whether he saw the car facing in or facing out, he never contacted the police, okay? If Helen Axe got married in August of 1965 and she was out in the car with her husband, wouldn't her husband, being a sailor, you know, being an upright sort of person, have called the um, Solano County Sheriff's Office about the sighting of a murder that night. Okay, I I think he would have. The reason not to do that would be if Helen Axe was out in the car with, with some guy who wasn't her boyfriend. And that would make sense of all of this other stuff. Okay? So all I'm pointing out here is that if you're basing putting the kids on the road 10, 15, 10, 30 p.m. that night. And remember, we still don't know what they were doing for that first hour and 15 minutes to an hour and a half. Now you've got a witness who has four strikes against her as far as her credibility goes. And that's what you're basing. You know, Richard was talking about, well, Sharon Henslin didn't, you know, didn't uh, contact the police about uh, Blue Rock Springs Park. Um, nothing that Helen Axe was doing that night makes any sense or afterwards, okay? That's the witness you're basing that sighting on. The only problem I have with Helen Axe is her identification of the car. I don't care. I could not care less about her personal circumstances. Whatever she was doing that night is fine with me. I believe that she saw the white Chevy Impala facing out of the road you know, facing out of the turnout and not the Rambler. And I believe what happened was, if you read the police report, it said that as Helen Axe passed the turnout, she recognized the car. I believe what Helen Axe probably said, maybe to Russ Butterback, was, you know, I saw, we can, you can look at video of the Rambler parked in the police lot. And I'm assuming that's the same video because, if you look at that video, you will also see an interview with Les Lundblad about the bullets hitting the car, okay? So I'm assuming Helen Axe saw that footage. She saw the Rambler parked in the police lot, and then she told Russ Butterback something to the effect of, when I saw that car in the video, I recognized it. I, excuse me, I recognized it as the same car that I saw the night before. However. I think she's wrong about that. I think the car that she saw was the white Chevy Impala because that's the car that everybody else saw right around that time and in that place. All right, let's 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 move on. Any response to that, Rich, or you want to move on? No, move on. Rich, do you hear me? All right, <laughs> all right. Let's, 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 do, uh, let's do Blue Rock Springs. Uh, Ray, uh, how, does this, how does this fit into your theory? Do you have this? Do you have any... Uh, contentions with the Blue Rock Springs timeline, or do you, do you think it's pretty cut and dry? Well, I mean, uh, the, on, the only two uh, events that I say were done by multiple people and were abductions are Riverside and uh, Lake Herman Road. Uh, Blue Rock Springs Park is more of a, uh, you know, of a hit and run type thing. What I would point out about Blue Rock Springs Park and I mentioned this to a commentator on my on my channel recently, is that 
the Zodiac Killer is a lot like James Bond in movies. If you've ever seen any of the James Bond movies, if James Bond is being chased by the bad guys and he's he's um, driving along the shore, he gets away because his car turns into a submarine. Okay, and he just you know goes under the sea and so forth and gets away that way. If he's on like some kind of flat expanse of land and the bad guys are chasing him, his car turns into a, an airplane, okay? If you look at what the Zodiac Killer did, he doesn't behave like any other serial killer. There's no, there's no trolling for victims. And he's prepared for whatever eventuality he happens to run into. If you look at Ted Bundy, for example, Bundy got caught because he was trolling for victims. He happened to be in a neighborhood where he didn't belong. And then the police stopped him. And when they checked out his car, they noticed that he'd taken the front passenger seat out of the front. And the, the front passenger seat of his VW was lying on the back seat. Okay. And they thought that was weird. And that was enough to get uh, Bundy taken in. Okay. But if you look at the Zodiac Killer, there's no, nobody saw that second car anywhere until James Owen went driving by. One person saw a second car. James Owen, I'm estimating he drove by about 11.09 p.m. that night, and he saw, uh, he saw that car that was parked next to the Faraday Rambler. I'm not even sure that he would have remembered the Faraday Rambler it's just that we know that the Rambler was there, and that's that's where the Rambler was parked when the police came along. But he didn't particularly notice the car. There was a, he noticed that there was a car parked parallel to the Rambler, okay? But nobody else saw that car in motion anywhere, and nobody else saw any kind of, like, strange car in the uh, neighborhood within a mile or so of the turnout that night, okay? So let's, I'm going to pretend I'm Richard Grinnell for a moment, and I'm going to, to pretend that it's a single Zodiac killer, and he pulls into the lot, and somehow he mag magically has this gun where he can, he can stick the gun up against um, David Faraday's left earlobe and shoot him. And then he has a gun, even though Betty Lou Jensen is running away from him, he has a gun like uh, was demonstrated on the Alfred Hitchcock show where there's a pen light or flashlight taped to the barrel of the gun. And it allows you to shoot somebody who is running away from you. Time out, Ray. Speculation, suspicions. speculation. We don't, we don't know that he had that flashlight gun. Zodiac later says that he had that flashlight gun in the But letter, wouldn't it so. explain his accuracy, though? It's possible. It's possible. But I, again, I don't think there, there's, like you said, there's, it's a scene with no right. witnesses, so we can't. So we're, yeah, okay, so we're going to question everything the Zodiac said, too. Absolutely we are. He's okay. a psychopathic lunatic. What are, you, what are you taking Zodiac's ramblings as 100% fact? Of course he's going to talk himself up as much as possible. What were you saying, Rich? I was going to say, has Ray read the autopsy report of Betty Lou Jensen? Then he'll realize that you don't have, the, the killer didn't have to be accurate because the, the first three shots, as I've explained before, came, came and hit the top right side of her back at a very acute angle. They went across her heart. The shots weren't fired at Betty Lou, the initial three shots anyway, when she was running directly away from the killer. She was running side onto the killer. Every single shot fired that night had a right to left trajectory. Every shot was probably shot within 10, 12 feet before she even got to the end of that rambler. So the killer didn't have to be accurate at all. And this is what people don't do. They don't read the police reports. If they did, they wouldn't say, oh, the killer was really accurate. He hit her back five times on the right side. Well, there's... The reason he hit her five times on the right side is because her right side was facing the killer when he shot her. After he shot David Faraday, she obviously ran. He turned around probably because he's certainly not going to fire, fire five shots at Betty Lou with his back turned to David. After he killed David, she ran or she was forced to run and then he fired immediately. As Ray knows, GSR was detected with the first shot. He didn't think any pause 
for half an hour until she got square on. Every one of those shots was at very close range. So the people claiming the Zodiac killer had to be accurate or a marksman or a policeman or ex-military is talking out their ass, basically. Kind of right. Kind of right, Ray. So you're, wait a minute, you're saying that she Ray knows the importance of autopsies because... I would say every single shot, at least the first three or four, was shot when her right side was facing the killer. No, she was running well, was, across was him. She she, with, she was probably, she within three feet the entire time then? No, I didn't say that. I three said what? for the three car? or four shots, she was at least inside of the back of the Rambler. And then the, the fatal shot was the probably one that struck her heart, and she staggered the remaining and and fell 33 feet, because you know she fell backwards, to about 28 and a half feet. So all I'm saying is every bullet had a right to left trajectory, and I know bullets can get deflected by internal structures of the body, but all five don't hit her body and deflect by about 70 degrees, which means the first three or four shots were shot at really close range, and then she staggered the remaining distance before she finally collapsed after all it was a 0.22 it wasn't the deadliest of weapons <clears throat> but uh you know all i'm pointing this out for is because you know the importance ray of reading the autopsy report which is why a lot of people make the same mistake with the sherry joe bates case i don't to Think be what? honest i don't see how that changes anything what? because first of all we know that she had she had turned away from the killer because all the shots hit her in the back okay now whether whether she was like angled you know, you can, you could be, she could be like slightly angled away from the shooter and still produce the effect that you're talking about. Okay. What I'm saying is we know that since all of the, what is this guy saying? If you look at her picture in the morgue, the bullet wounds are not, is any that's time my, of grouping. That's I mean, my boy, Brian. I have no idea what that means. Um, A grouping are the shots collected, Ray. So what he's saying is if it was some sort of accurate expert marksman, all the grouping would be tightly grouped in a, in a certain Well, uh, okay. Here's the thing. If you want to insist that he was wrong about having a, a, um, a uh, flashlight tape to his, um, to his uh, gun barrel, be my guest. Okay. We know that when he went to Blue Rock Springs park and he came out of the car, he was holding one of those lantern lights in one hand, presumably in his left hand. And his right hand, he had the gun. Of course, the kids didn't see the fact that he had a gun in his hand. And so when he got up to where the car was, he was he was uh, firing. OK, so let's eliminate. Let's do what David Fincher did and eliminate Blue Rock Springs Park for or Blue, eliminate Lake Herman Road for a moment, if you insist. And we'll just say he had he had a lantern light and a gun at Blue Rock Springs Park. Then he gets to Lake Berryessa and he has pre-cut uh, uh, clothesline cord, plastic clothesline cord. He's got a 45. Once he has them tied up, he pulls it. That's when he pulls his double-bladed uh, knife out, okay? So the point I was trying to make before was, like James Bond, he is ready for whatever situation he happens to be presented with. And... That coupled with the fact that he's chasing, he's changing his modus operandi each time out, uh, suggests uh, uh, that the that the crimes themselves were staged. Okay, and that's particularly if we're if I'm right about the fact that he staged, had the gun barrel uh, staged. How? Had, I'm sorry. Staged how? What, what do you mean? That uh, well, he uh, the. Uh, I believe that the, for example, Blue Rock Springs Park, <clears throat> he has, he goes up to the window and he starts shooting. Okay. I believe um, Michael Magoo says that he went back to his car. Okay. Well, if he went back to his car to reload, that means he only had like four or five bullets in his gun to begin with. I, I don't see, I, I can't imagine someone who's a homicidal maniac going up to the car when he can have you know nine bullets in his gun wouldn't he have wouldn't have he wouldn't he have gone up to the car with a full clip okay 
what I believe happened was he after four or five shots, and Michael Michael jumped into the back seat of the car. Um, the Zodiac killer then stepped back just to reassess the situation because he wasn't expecting. I'm very surprised that Michael Magoo was able to jump into the back seat of the car. I'm, I'm not sure how he pulled that off. I mean, the Corvair is a very small car. Of course, he is a very thin guy. But I think what actually happened was the shooter took maybe a step back. And as a result of that, since Magoo was like lying on the floor of the back seat, the the shooter disappeared from the window frame. Okay. So I think Magoo thought that he had gone back to his car. I don't think he did. I think he just took a step back and decided, okay, I'm going to have to shove the gun into the car. And when Ed Russ checked the car afterwards, he found uh, two casings on the um, right rear floorboard. And the only way that could happen is if the gun itself had been thrust into the car. So we know that the killer was trying absolutely as hard as he could to kill Michael. And yet after nine shots, he stopped. Okay. So the question is why? And as I pointed out, um, what me 37 in the exorcist letter means is that I have taken 37 shots or, or stab wounds in the case of Lake Berryessa and the police haven't laid a glove on me. He, I think he was limited to 10 shots at Lake, at, uh, Lake Herman Road to nine shots at Blue Rock Springs Park. And that's why he had to drive away and leave Michael still alive because he, he had run out of ammunition, basically. And he still needed the one shot to uh, shoot Paul Stein with. So, so in that sense, all of the crimes were staged in the sense that they were, I, they, were, um, they were planned to only have like a limited number of shots and a limited, limited number of stab wounds. Um, jump in, Rich. Can I ask Ray a question? Go ahead. Fire away. Can I ask Ray a question? Do you For agree with me, Ray, that the killer? Do you agree with me that the killer at Blue Rock Springs likely fired at the driver first and not Michael Majot? In other words, yes. he shot Darlene Ferrin, which is what. She I've had been, four I say entry that and four exit wounds in a rear. Yeah. If you go to my video, that's exactly what I said because Michael Magoo was dead to rights. All they all he had to do was walk up to him, stick the gun against his head, and, and shoot him. Okay. So clearly he shot at Darlene first. And that allowed Michael yeah. to react and jump into the back seat of the car. So Richard is right again. That's three times Richard Richard is right. No, 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 no surprise there. So oh my. Ray, no, Richard has now broken the clocks, the stop clock syndrome, where you're only <laughs> right twice a day. He's been right three times now. So Ray, how how does Joe's description of the Zodiac relate to the the physical description of your of your trigger man? Does it mesh? Well, I've been corrected on that already. Now is is that the Mike Butterfield? I think at some point in the past I said that uh, I. <laughs> Because I didn't know what I was talking about at the time, and I said that the sketch was based on Michael Magoo's description. And Butterfield pointed out that Michael Magoo was blinded by the the lantern light or whatever it was, and he did not provide a uh, sketch to police because he just didn't get a very good look at at the shooter, except for the fact that I think he said that he had like a very kind of fat face you know he had like face. a very full face yeah yeah I, I don't mean a composite sketch but just the verbal description does that does that match your your shooter your suspect that's my question well again I, I you're familiar with the golden state killer right yep how many how many sketches of the golden state killer were there a dozen two dozen how many of them actually looked like joseph joseph james d'angelo Maybe one of them. Yeah, I mean, you could make the same the same argument with, with Ber Berkowitz, but here's here's something you just said that that doesn't mesh, Ray. You, you said that Zodiac adapts to the situation like he comes ready, but then you said that he's going to come with a predetermined, limited amount of rounds, limited amount of stab wounds. So if he's 
coming to make these murders and make sure the victims are dead, why is he not bringing multiple magazines for the pistol? He's just going to assume that whatever's that he has loaded is going to get the job done. And also, I don't think Majot ever said anything about him reloading. He said he walked away because he thought Majot was dead. He heard him gurgling and cry out for help and then turned around and, and walked back. So I, I, on one said, hand, you said he's prepared and adapting. And on the other hand, you said he has a limited amount of, of rounds. I don't see how that, that meshes. No, I think the whole thing was planned ahead of time. And I think, uh, for example, they had, you know, planned ahead of time to send Z340, which is this thing here. I don't know if you guys can. This is, I think this is one of the, uh, I think I got this from uh, Tom Voigt's um, uh, website. I think he used to sell Z340 shirts. Um, no, I think it was all planned out ahead of time and how many times they were going to strike. And um, so that's that's why I think when he walked up to the car at uh, Blue Rock Springs Park, he had a clip inside the gun, which which had nine bullets in it. And I think they also planned, I think they planned to fire 10 times at uh, Lake Herman Road. And the problem with that is that they, it only took six bullets to kill the two teenagers. So they had to kind of imp improvise after that. So you're saying that he came with a preloaded number of rounds in the magazine. Well, we all do. I mean, if you, if you're going up to, if to you're good, if you go hunting, uh, you're, uh, you know, or if you go target practicing, you're going to, I mean, your clip is going to have an X number of uh, bullets in it. I mean, that's, it's just a question of how, of how big a clip you want to be. I've had, I've had people, uh, inform me, I think Brian, um, you know, our, our friend, Brian, uh, Pen Pettengill yeah, was uh, telling me about, um, about, uh, you know, what the standard magazine capacity was. Back in the 1960s, I think, and I believe it, I'm not sure if this is what Brian told me. I think you could get a clip even in 1968, 69, that was as, as much as like 13 bullets in it. I think you can get ridiculous numbers now for for uh, guns, but uh, I think I think the biggest clip you could get maybe back then was like 13 bullets. But I mean, okay. uh, whatever, Ross. Whatever gun you have, it's going to have a set number of bullets in it, okay? So, I mean, in that sense... I'm, I'm aware, Ray, w what I'm asking you, because the standard is mostly 10 rounds. Well, whatever, you know, I think... So, so were, were you saying that it was preloaded to nine rounds because of yeah. a reference in the cipher? Is that is that what... what what's I the think, correlation? I think the, the purpose of Z340 and the purpose of saying Me 37 SFPD 0 is to point out that he had struck 37 times, 20 times by gun, that's vertical, 17, 17 times by knife, that's horizontal, okay? So in Z340, you have 20 rows and 17 columns, okay? So that was gotcha. the point of the gotcha. cipher. It was gotcha, to make, gotcha, gotcha. All right, it was to make the got... point that the crimes were staged, at least in the sense that they knew how many shots they were going to fire and how many stab wounds they were going to inflict. Got you, got you. And so, by the way, as long as we're on that topic, okay, isn't it true, for example, that at Lake Berryessa, after he stabs the couple, okay, let's put all our all other arguments aside. We know that he planned to walk up the hill to the car, went to the passenger side door, and wrote out that message. Now, does anyone honestly believe that he hadn't planned that ahead of time? That it was just like spontaneous? No, I think I think he wrote it out, and I, you could get your take on it, Rich. But I think he wrote it out in reference to the Tate LaBianca murders and the and the graffiti left at the scene of the crime. He was trying to outdo that, so I I do agree that he uh, he planned it. But I'm still struggling with how you have this MIT you know, professor, you know, having all this knowledge of Lake Berryessa and, and Vallejo and all these Northern California places, why you just can't have a local suspect, you know, it, it, Occam's razor would, would say that it's much just likely a Northern California, you know, resident, you know?
Does that make sense, Ray? Well, I agree with Ray. He did plan out the writing on the car door in advance, just like he planned to take a shirt piece in advance well before he arrived at Presidio Heights that night. Agreed. Because if you remember with Jack Stilts, he, he asked the Zodiac and he said the exact words, I want proof that, that uh, I want the person, I want to prove that the letter writer and the murderer are the same person. Zodiac sent the August the 4th letter. And he says to prove on the Zodiac, blah, 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 and all that stuff. He said prove in it somewhere. And then when he gets to um, Presidio Heights, if you notice in the October the 13th letter, he says to prove I am the Zodiac, here's a piece of his bloodstained shirt. So he was harking back to the time when Jack Stilt actually was questioning the Zodiac killer. So the very same way he planned to write on the car door at Berryessa, he planned well in advance to take the shirt piece from Paul Stein, which is why I contest it wasn't torn because how on earth would he know in advance the quality of Paul Stein's shirt, the hem? How difficult is it to tear a good hem on a shirt with your fingers? I don't care what you do. You're not going to tear that. And he could have been wearing a denim top. He could have been wearing anything. I think this was planned in advance. And that's why the three Robbins kids said they thought they saw a glint of a knife. Now, that may have been initially to create the cut. Then he may have torn the rest of it. But there's no actual evidence from analysis of those fibers that is available to us to determine whether it was torn or cut. But how on earth would you know the quality of Paul Stein's shirt and the ability for you to just tear an item of his clothing? But I agree with Ray. Okay. The, he definitely planned to prove himself to be the Zodiac by writing on the card or exactly like he did at Presidio Heights. Yeah. See, Richard's finally starting to make sense now. You know, it took him two hours, but yeah. look, you know. Yeah, yeah, they're kind of getting you, getting on you on, in the chat, Ray, about the rambles. But uh, you know, so everyone always says that Zodiac never takes uh, takes credit for Lake Berryessa. However, he makes the phone call after, right? He writes on uh, uh, Brian's car door. He also writes in the letter that I killed those two kids in the North Bay area. So it seems to me that he took quite a bit of credit for. Lake well, the, the point is he didn't need to take credit for it be in any of the letters because it was obvious he had written on the car door and he'd warned the Zodiac could. Now, the, the, uh, the uh, blowback that I get all the time, I just had a guy... Um, uh, messaged me a uh, comment on my Lake Berryessa video. And he said, well, wait a minute, Brian almost bled out. You're saying that he deliberate, he tried to avoid killing the two, killing the couple so that somebody would remember the hood that he made. And I pointed out, I said, well, first of all, um, attacking people with a knife is a very inexact science. I mean, there's no, look, the Zod we know that the Zodiac killer was trying as hard as he could to kill Brian, um, to kill Michael Magoo, and he still wasn't able to do it. Okay, so I mean, you don't, uh, you don't. It, it is impossible to tell absolutely what his intent was. However, uh, it okay. does seem to me that if you have two people hogtied in front of you, and you've got a double-bladed knife, and keep in mind, although, you know, obviously. Uh, you know, Brian was stabbed. I believe Brian was stabbed seven times and Cecilia was stabbed 10 times. They were still able to untie one another after the killer left. And they didn't start to believe that they might be in danger of dying until they stood up and they started to feel faint. But Brian was still able to walk up to the highway and, uh, you know, uh, attempt to uh, flag flag cars down from there so it just seems to me that if i'm a, a homicidal maniac with a double-bladed uh, knife and i have two people hogtied in front of me i'm going to be able to inflict a fatal wound somewhere you know somewhere in there so that i tend to believe that uh that the killer's intent was to with that he at, at the very least that he wanted one of the victims to survive so that they could report on the fact that he was wearing a uh, Zodiac gear. Yeah. I mean, I don't know that, that 
last part is was he really that, go ahead was he, really, was he really that bothered that he killed the victims it was the attack that was the most important thing because six of the seven victims you could well apart from probably david faraday although that's debatable were technically alive when he left the crime scenes he, have you, as you well, pointed out at Berryessa, you could, well, they could easily have slit their throats. He could have stabbed them 20 yeah. times, but he didn't. Shot him with the gun. I don't yeah. think killing them was the primary of importance to him. The attack, well, if they see, died, they died. If they didn't. See, here's the here's the funny thing. Now, we're, we're about two hours into this debate, and I've been getting all kinds of um, of blowback as a result of saying, well, you know, giving my case theory and so forth. But what do people do on Zodiac Killer message boards? They psychoanalyze the killer. And that's what Richard just did. Now, I'm not, you know, let's be clear. I'm not uh, condemning him for that, but I'm just because usually in a case of a serial killer, we're trying to figure out what the guy's motivation is, okay? But all I'm saying is there is no way of knowing What's what's really going on with a lot of these serial killers? I mean, uh, there, it, there, it is still a matter of debate as to whether Ted Kaczynski was actually a domestic terrorist or he was a serial killer. Because on the one hand, his man, if you go by his manifesto, it seems like he was a domestic terrorist. On the other hand, people have said, and Kaczynski kind of implied the fact that he wasn't trying to change any policy or anything. He was just mad at the world and he wanted to get even and to do that by killing people, okay? So it really isn't, it's not cut and dried, even if you're talking about cases where you've got a an Occam's razor situation where you can figure out, okay, this looks like a fairly simple crime, but you don't know necessarily what the motivation of the uh, killer was, okay? So... Right, it's, right. And the other thing is, if I were going, if I were running amok and saying, hey, I'm a serial killer specialist, and I believe Ted Bundy had uh, Confederates who were helping him kill people, and the same, I mean, there are people who have said that about the son of Sam, for example, that he may have had, uh, that he may have belonged to a cult. And I think there are actually books out that uh, say that that they believe that he belonged to some sort of weird cult, okay? Uh, I don't say that about any other case. The only case I say it about is the Zodiac case. In fact, um, one of the things I was telling Ned DeHaan before our before uh, my association with Ned came to its untimely end, one yeah, of the we'll things that Ned and I were going to do is we were going to do other videos about other cases. I was going to do a video with Ned on Ted Bundy, we we're going to do a video on, uh, you know, the JFK assassination. We're going to do one. Well, we we didn't do one about uh, Joan Webster. We're going to do one on, on her. Okay, but uh, the JFK assassination that'll probably be my next video. And I'm a lone gunman person. You know, you would think somebody who believes that the Zodiac case was a was a case of conspiracy would be a conspiracy theorist in. Uh, the JFK, but I'm not. I believe Oswald acted alone. So I mean, yeah, it's... there's 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 no way that that single bullet theory, magic bullet, works in any sort of well, see, gravity on on planet Earth. See right? what I but, mean? Uh, so Ross is yeah. a conspiracy theorist. No, I'm a single Zodiac killer, but I, I just, no, but yeah, I mean multiple, JFK. Multiple I get you. I get what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, see, that's what I mean. I mean, it's it's a question yeah, we, of you're looking at yeah. the evidence and deciding what you think. Right, right, 100%. But the thing is, Richard made that uh, observation based off Zodiac's pre, you know, pre-established, you know, MO of the evidence that he is not either finishing the victims off or waiting to kill them, which he has multiple weapons and multiple ways of doing. He's running straight back home and 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 writing the letter, which is what's creating the the, the media hype. Is his his his, you know, kind of priority one is to write as many letters as possible, mail in the ciphers, get it on as many front pages as possible because it's all ego driven. Let's let's take some questions for uh for Ray. We have one question. I've never one more time, Rich. Sorry, I've never psychoanalyzed the Zodiac killer. What I've said is he could have finished the victims off if he wanted to. I agree with Ray right. on this one. 
you can't stop to analyze this guy. Agreed. This is a Agreed. hocus pocus sort of stuff. What I yeah. what I said was you could have killed them off. That's all I'm saying. Anyway, yeah, no, carry on. You want to read off, that? As Richard said, that's based off the evidence. So Ray, are there any other suspects you'd be open to considering, such as Richard Gaikowski or Chester Klingel? <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, he's he's kind of stuck on his thing. Yeah, I'm pretty uh, much. Uh, it's only been now. Let's see. 1989. How many years is that? 34 years. I don't think I'm about to switch anytime soon. I got you. Uh, how about so? As far as the letters, Ray, have you and Rich ever discussed your your letter writing suspect? Um, do you what do you think is authentic from your suspect, Ray? Do you have it going past? Well, now we're now we're going to get into some really uh, nasty stuff between me and Richard because if you start to talk about the letters, yes, please. Um, Let, let's do. I'll tell you what. Let me. Uh, oh, no, I'm going. It won't be nice. I'm going to throw back what Richard has been doing to me for the last two hours and do it to him now, okay? And and I'm going to base it on something that Ross said, okay? Uh-oh. Where Ross is talking about what most people think, okay? What most people think about the Zodiac case. Let's take a look. I want you to take 100 people from Zodiac Killer message boards, okay? And I want you to show those 100 people the Fairfield letter, okay? And I guarantee you that at least 75 or 80 of those people, maybe more than that, their immediate reaction to that letter is, that's not a Zodiac letter. Uh, which letter? Is this 78? The Fairfield that? letter. That's an argument at bottom. It's a fallacy. You remember... Do you remember going back a few hundred years? There was probably a handful of people in the world that thought it was round. Everybody thought the Earth was flat. That doesn't. That doesn't. That yeah, argument but is according to Ross, it comes down to what most Just people think. More, no. Uh, yeah, but ahead, most people finish your point, sir. Most people don't analyze the letters to death, do they? For starters, most people just say handwriting and tone, and that's the end of their argument. Oh, the handwriting. Well, Richard, you're making my yet. argument. Tone. Absolute nonsense. Yeah, you're. Have thank you. You're making. Have, have you ever looked at the John my Bonnet argument. Ramsey case? Can you have a look at the John Bonnet Ramsey case? I can get you ten document examiners tomorrow that said that was written by Patsy Ramsey. I can get ten certified document examiners that say that wasn't written by Patsy Ramsey. Where are we? All the document examiners disagree in the Zodiac case. This. That's why handwriting is not allowed in a U.S. court of law. And this is why handwriting is an assistance to a crime. It's part of the evidence. But when, when I hear people say, oh, the handwriting doesn't look like Zodiac or the tone doesn't sound like Zodiac, that is crap. Yeah, and that's why the desktop poem is the Melvin not Belli the Riverside, Ray. The Melvin Belli letter was a conciliatory, the Melvin Belli letter was a conciliatory letter apologizing all... Oh, please, this, please, that. Totally different to the early letters. So if you're going to use tone, then the Belli letter isn't genuine, and we know it is. Totally different tone. So that's a totally basis argument. Plus, the handwriting of the Belli letter is different to the first four letters as well. So is the button letter different. So this argument of handwriting, when somebody says, oh, I'll look at that for 10 seconds, and it's not a Zodiac letter because I've just decided it don't look right, that's a pathetic argument. I'm just, I'm just I'd telling you... Myself who I'm just telling you what most people, most most Zodiac people, would Don't. tell you, which is they would look at the Fairfield letter and they immediately say, "That's not a Zodiac letter." On the other hand, my guess is the same people would look at the 2001 letter and say, "Yeah, that does look like Zodiac." Okay, so you know, yeah, it's can I, you're can making I ask you my one question. point. Can I ask you one question? Good, Rich. Can I ask you one question then about say, the Fairfield letters, right? If I asked you, what are the five reasons I give for the Fairfield letters being genuine? Can you name any of them? No. Because well, I, I completely... No, I No, let me explain why, Richard. It's because no, I completely I dismiss it. out of hand that the Fairfield letter is a Zodiac letter, Okay. That's Sorry, pal. Because you're not interested. Sorry, because buddy. You're not interested. 
I'm not interested. not interested in any he, If you position. go to my video, you go to my let, video let that finish, says Ray, letters. Ray, let what finish. does it say? Let, 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 let him respond. Let him respond, Ray. Go to my video that says letters. What does it say? The intent was to send 26 letters. He sent five in Riverside. He sent 17 in these during the Zodiac proper period from 69 through 71. Then he sent four more in 1974. That adds up to 26. And as I said, part of the reason for that is that they were using a coding system that you that employed alphabet numbers, where A is one, B is two, C is three, and so forth. Okay, yeah, it's, it's wild. It's wild speculation, Ray. Uh, well, any how first do you, of all, how do you reconcile anything RPD? that you say how about you the reconcile, Zodiac killer speculation? How do you reconcile RPD coming out and saying that the Bates had to die letters are 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 from that hoaxer and they don't match? Because that right there would take three of your letters right off your list. Yeah, I'll tell you what. Uh, here's my suggestion is get Mike Morford on here and we'll, and the three of us will talk about RPD. Okay. Well, the three of us will talk about how responsive RPD is. So you disagree is. with their announcement? What? You disagree uh, with I, the announcement. I'll tell you exactly what it is. There's two things here. Number one, you have to assume an incredible coincidence took place. Here's what happened. A teenager on April 30th, 1967, sent three loose leaf letters to um, Riverside PD, to the Press Enterprise, and to Joseph Bates. This teenager sent three uh, letters to uh, those three people, and two of the letters, two of the loose leaf letters had this symbol on it, a Z. Okay. Well, it wasn't now, held on. It had a stylized Z. It's not. It looked simple, like a right? Z it's to a, me. It's it's a stylized Z. It sure looked like a Z to me. Here's the thing. We'll call it a stylized character. Here's the thing. This was April thirtieth, nineteen sixty-seven. When did the Zodiac Killer become a known serial killer? That would have been when he sent the first letter after Blue Rock Spring, or well, like it, he was the code killer or the cipher killer before he named himself. Zodiac. August nineteen sixty nine is when we found out he was calling himself Zodiac Killer. So from April thirtieth, nineteen sixty seven, that's the fourth month. This is the eighth month. So it's two years, two years and four months later. This incredible coincidence takes place where he's got a, a letter right in the center of the sheet that sure looks like a Z. Two of the three letters have that letter. And then in August of 69, a series of crimes that are connected to this crime by at least 50% of the, of the so-called experts on it. It's the Zodiac Killer. How, how this teenager knew that that was going to happen, that's amazing. But that's only one of two reasons to believe. That the, that the letters were accurate. The other reason to believe, take a look at the envelopes. You can go to Tom Voigt's website. It will show you the envelopes, and you will notice that all three of those letters are double-posted. And they are double-posted exactly the same way the letters in the Bay Area were posted. Okay? Sure. N nobody knows more about the envel envelopes than, than, than Richard Grinnell. And the other thing... Uh, well, you're wrong about that. I worked for the U.S. Postal Service for 37 years, and I can tell you from experience that for every letter that is overposted that goes through the uh, mail system, you have literally thousands of letters that are either underposted or don't have any postage at all on them, okay? So the fact that, that a letter is overposted is, uh, is cause for uh, comment, okay? Yeah, and the fact you. that... All of the letters in the Bay Area were double posted, and the three loose leaf letters are double posted. Yeah, plus, we, we get it. We get it, Ray. R Richard has the plus same the Z. And here's the other thing: well, it isn't like this, Z, sir, this the guy, Z. the guy with the the guy with the hoax letter in 2016. I've had people tell me, well, he came forward. He didn't come forward. He sent an anonymous letter in as a hoax and, and then the only reason him. they found out who the guy was is they is that they did a gene, genealogical tracing of his dna 
apparently he licked the envelope. And that's how they, they were able to um, to uh, track him down. And the fact is, you can go back and you can look at the Riverside PD statement, and it doesn't say anything definitive about the guy of the 67 letters being a hoax. Can't they, can't they test that sample versus the original envelopes and verify, obviously? I'm just, I'm just telling you, if you look at RPD's statement, it is worded, and that's, that's why I mentioned Mike Morford. Uh, when you're dealing with RPD, getting a straight answer out of them about anything is no, no, I know, I know, amazing. I know. Morph's been on the channel several times, Ray. Uh, you guys can Morph and I are in total Just agreement on that. Point. Subscribe to the Zodiac Files, Planet X Filmworks. Um, and also, what I was my litmus test, Ray, wasn't what most people in the Zodiac community think. It was all of the pre-established investigation of SFPD, Toshki, uh, Armstrong, VPD, the FBI. I'm saying it, it it all goes in one direction. So every time this is how you ended up on Michael Butterfield's crackpock files, one of you guys come across with an MIT professor and say that it all relates back to this Joan Weber conspiracy. I'm constantly asking you, how did FBI miss all of that? How did how did everybody who's looked at all of the police reports and all of the evidence, all of the forensics, every single one of these times, miss these these <clears throat> publicly named suspects as you as you've done in your book? And wouldn't you admit, uh, Richard, do you think that it's a little unethical that Ray sent all these copies of Zodiac Killer Solved to Michael O'Hare's uh, 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 place of business? Would you say that was a little out of line, Richard? What's your stance on that? Well, all I would say on that is I wouldn't do it. But I remember Ray saying that if there was, <coughs> if he thought there was uh, anything malicious in it, he would have took him to court, but he didn't. But what I would suggest is taking somebody to court is not cheap. That's probably why he didn't want to do it, because it costs money to take people to court. Sure. That doesn't back up the idea that Ray's assertion is correct, because I wouldn't take correct. somebody to court if it's going to cost me an arm and a leg. Yeah, it's, it's Ray's position that, that O'Hare would fight back legally, uh, you know what I mean, as per him na naming him the Zodiac. But I, I, just don't, I just don't see it, Ray. Well, here's the thing. It was not just a matter of whether he had to fight back in court or not. First of all, my book accused his mother of being a serial killer. Okay, you have that. Which then there's nonsense. this other thing. Michael O'Hare had two little daughters who had to be taken out of their daycare and taken to the other end of the country. Michael O'Hare's wife, Deborah Sanderson, worked for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. She had to quit her job and move to the West Coast. Same thing with his mother. Remember, his mother was being accused of being a serial killer. His mother had to give up all her gallery contacts and museum contacts in the greater Boston area and moved to the West Coast. I have to assume that when I sent my letter, wait a minute. This is now, what the book looked like. Which, I mean, which I, serial killer is she, Ray? She, I, I thought you only had one trigger, man. Is she a separate serial, serial killer from the Zodiac? I, Herta I Margulies, I explained that already. Go watch the beginning of this video, Ross. I explained who Berta Margulies is. No, I, I, I understood that, but okay, carry on. Okay. This is the book that I sent. I sent 90 copies to um, Harvard in November of 1990. What I'm assuming happened is that the Harvard administration, I sent six copies to the provost at Harvard, to the president at Harvard, and I had a cover letter with this, with this uh, book. And remember, I don't do anything without giving people an out, okay? So, for example, during my mailing of my book to Harvard, I had a cover letter, and I basically said, look, this is what this, you don't necessarily even have to read this book. I'll, I will tell you what's inside it. It accuses Michael O'Hare, who is a lecturer in public policy at the JFK School, of being uh, the trigger man of the, in the, the uh, Zodiac murders. If Mr. O'Hare would like to take me to court, or he doesn't even need to do that. Richard just said it would have, would have cost him money. No, it wouldn't have. 
Uh, Michael O'Hare could have filed a cease and desist order. I have to read this. Thank you for all the great podcasts. Oh, okay. That has to do with Richard. Yeah, we'll um, finish your point. We'll get to it. First of all, uh, Michael O'Hare's lawyer or a lawyer for Harvard could simply have sent me a cease and desist letter. That's done by lawyers all the time. When lawyers don't want, when uh, complainants, and I, I don't know how this is done in Great Britain, okay? You're talking about two different legal systems. But in the United States, if you want to, let's say Ross and I had some, I can't imagine Ross and I disagreeing on anything, but let's assume. Yeah, me either. Yeah, let's assume Ross and I got into some kind of like legal battle, okay? The first thing I would do, you don't want to go to court. So what a lawyer does is he writes this thing called the cease and desist letter. And that's designed to tell you, hey, if you want to avoid going to court, then stop this thing, whatever you're doing that I disagree with, okay? And we can all walk away and not uh, not be upset. And frankly, that's all Michael O'Hare had to do, okay? That's all Harvard had to do. I'm guessing that the provost at Harvard went to Michael O'Hare and said, listen, if you don't want to sue this guy, we can have our lawyers contact him. You know, if you don't want to take legal action, we can have our lawyers do it. There are all sorts of remedies that were available to Michael O'Hare. There's a there is a saying in the law, at least over here in the United States, it's that there is no right without a remedy. In other words, you don't go to court to just to prove yourself right or wrong. Did you ever see that movie, A Civil Action, where they're talking yeah. about how they get even with the the people who uh, polluted the stream or whatever it is that um, that they had a problem with in the in the movie, and the lawyer tells um, Robert Duvall character tells John Travolta he says the way you get even with people in our system is by getting money from them. Okay, so for example, you sue whatever it was the power company or what have you for a hundred million dollars. Okay. And then, you know, that gets argued back and forth and so forth, okay? But the point I'm trying to make is there is no right without a remedy. So all Michael O'Hare needed to do or Harvard needed to do was to get me to stop doing that. And just by doing that, you can do, you don't have to file anything. You can just send the letter saying, yeah, you know, we right, just... It's, we, it's, it sounds like a Harvard professor and his attorneys and the staff maybe maybe thought your theory was like ludicrous and asinine and they just didn't want to be involved. Well, then why wasn't he working there the following academic year? Because you ruined his uh, reputation by sending the book to everybody on staff? Well, you're talking about people who are very intelligent and, and would think highly of Michael O'Hare. And I, all I was was a mailman in Pittsburgh. <laughs> so what my guess is, Harvard went to Michael O'Hare and said, we will send this guy a cease and desist letter, or you can do it, or you can take an action. The only problem with doing that is that it leads you open to discovery. And as I said, I my, my guess is that Harvard gave Michael O'Hare an ultimatum and said, if you don't do something about this, we won't renew your contract. And that's how he ended up out at uh, Cal Berkeley. Okay. Okay. It's, it's, uh, yeah, again, it's, just, uh, it's Ross, right? Ross, this whole idea that you have that some people are above suspicion is wrong because we I don't. See... I, I, you're, you're assuming that I have that idea. If you gave us a smoking gun, Rich, and you had O'Hare's fingerprints. Rich is the other guy. The... Oh, my bad, Rich. If you gave us the smoking gun, Ray, and you had the, you know, Michael O'Hare <laughs> fingerprints all over Paul Stein's cab, Richard and I would be sitting here agreeing with you. The problem is you wrote this book. You wouldn't a have a website suspect. if that were true. Ross, you wouldn't have, if I had I don't have a website. Can I, can I ask right Ross? Question? Yes, no. you can. No, I yes, want to finish I'm, my I'm point. I'm the moderator. All right, fine. Finish your point. Then Rich is asking. I want to finish my point before I get. Look. Um, if Richard or I had forensic evidence that proved that somebody was the Zodiac killer, we wouldn't be having this conversation right now because it would have gone to court. We'd have the forensic evidence, whatever it was, and the Zodiac case would already be solved. OK, so the only way you can make any points along those lines is the way that I do it. It's the way Richard does it. It's the way uh, Drew Beeson does it 
where you present it circumstantially online and in books. I understand. And so I understand, Ray. But but here's the thing: you publicly named a suspect. Richard didn't do that. I didn't do that. So it's a valid criticism to you of why the FBI, if you submitted your evidence to any law enforcement body, why they wouldn't acknowledge that they looked at it or whatever. But anyway, let's go on to this question. For Well, uh, Galileo for went to the Inquisition and told them that uh, the Earth sure. revolves around the sun. And the Inquisition said, well, we think the sun revolves around the Earth. OK, and they brought so, their so gavel down and that was the, it. You consider yourself the Galileo. Of the no, Earth. I don't. We, we, we got it. Thank you. I Ray. said that so, in my video. I do not compare myself to I Galileo. I'm just I, pointing I'm that, aware. making that point. Thank you for the great podcast, Richard. Is there any connection between Rock. Arthur Lee Allen and Rock. Melvin Belli? I'm guessing this is a reference to the movie when Gray Smith declared that the letter or the phone call was on Arthur Lee Allen's uh, birthday, but we all know that's trash. Any, any way in, Rich? No, can I ask uh, Ray that question first? Yeah, go for it. No. I'm just kidding, Richard. Go ahead. <laughs> if you Understood. take out the numbers game, are the more code thing that you presented against your four suspects, including Michael O'Hare, what other evidence have you got for any of them being the Zodiac Killer other than this numbers game? And um, let me finish. And if you took this to a, a jury and presented this evidence of numbers games to a jury, what do you think they would say? Conceptual art. Whoa. Case closed. How many, how many books have I sent you? I sent books to your address in Coventry. And Did read, you read the books that I sent I read, you? Read them. But you, I have read your books, but you haven't read the last 700 articles I've written. The Ooh. look, Michael o, Michael O'Hare has done things. You don't even need to listen to me, Richard. Richard, here's what I want you to do. Here's an exercise mm. for you. Go on the web archive, okay, and go to zodiackiller.com, Tom Voigt's website. I don't think you can do this on his current site. So you have to uh, uh, take advantage of the uh, Wayback Machine. You go on the Wayback Machine. And you click on a version of Tom's site, maybe from like 2010 or 2011. And what you will see on there is the original archive message board. Okay. Uh, in other words, the current message board that he has on his site is his third message board. He had he had his original board was which was from like 20 plus years ago. Then he had a message board that was went from like 2004 till 2007 or so. And then he had his current board, okay? If you go on the web archive and you go to uh, Tom's website and you go to his original archive message board, uh, what you will see there is, for example, Mike Butterfield was on that board. Um, uh, who else was on it? Jake Wark was on, the, was on that board. Um, there were a lot of guys who used to be like very well known in the Zodiac online community. If you go on that um, message board, you will see like other Zodiac suspects and you click on that and you will see a, an article. It says O'Hare email address and you click on that. OK, and what that is, is it's a discussion of the possible guilt of Michael O'Hare and his relationship with Gareth Penn. Now, here's something you have to understand. In the year 2000, when that uh, thread went up. Nobody knew who Ray Grant was because I hadn't posted online about the Zodiac Killer until I posted on Mike Morford's private board in June of 2010. So none of the people who are posting on that message board knew anything about me or my theory. They hadn't seen they hadn't seen this book. Okay, I'm sorry, this book, although they were familiar with Gareth Penn and, you know, the Mensa Bullet and so, and so forth. So the point I'm trying to make here is that they considered Michael O'Hare a reasonable suspect. In point of fact, if you go to the uh, film, I think it's called Hunting the Zodiac, that Tom Voigt was in, uh, I think it's like circa 2007 or so. I think it came out either right before or right after the David Fincher film. 
Um, uh, Tom Voigt talks about the fact that Richard Gajkowski was his favorite suspect. And then somebody asks one of the other guys, maybe it was um, Howard Davis or uh, Ed Neal, asks Tom Voigt, he says, well, what if Gajkowski ends up being eliminated, you know, for whatever reason? Uh, who's your next suspect? And Tom Voigt says, Michael O'Hare, okay? Now, he was just kidding when he said that, but the point I'm trying to make is Michael O'Hare was a suspect before Ray Grant showed up online with, with you know, my books or, or my websites or any of the other stuff. So the, the idea that O'Hare is somehow, um, you know, uh, some kind of crazy suspect is wrong. He was a suspect before, at least before I showed up online. The other thing I would say about this is there's this misconception that serial killers get caught because the police catch them in the act. And 99% of the time, that's not what happens. What happens is, for example, what happened to Ted Bundy, which is the police caught Bundy when he was trolling for victims. And the only reason they detained Bundy is that when they opened up his car and took a look at it, as I said, they noticed that he had taken the front passenger seat uh, out of his VW Beetle. And then one of the detectives back at headquarters said, wait a minute, Carol Durange, who is the victim of an aggravated kidnapping, said that when the guy got her into his VW Beetle, the front passenger seat was gone, okay? So the point I'm trying to make here is the idea that somebody is necessarily going to be connected by, even by a criminal act necessarily, isn't true. A lot of times people get caught, serial murders get caught when they're doing something that isn't even criminal. Uh, John Wayne Gacy is another example. Gacy was called in for an interview. All right, right. I gotta, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta put us back on on, on subject here. Uh, any, any response, Rich? Well, I would say there's been probably about a thousand suspects named in the last few years. Not suspects, persons of interest, which probably shows you how great a technique that people use to uh, identify subject. If ever, if this was a good technique to identify suspects. They'd all arrive at the same suspect, but they don't. We've got a thousand different ones of all different professions, heights, ages, accents, uh, intelligence. But they've all been molded to one guy called the Zodiac Killer. This shows what a terrible technique this is. A hundred percent correct. And, and and here's the thing, Ray. Can, can you put O'Hare? It's uh, only the way almost every serial killer has been caught. Okay. Uh, hey, Richard. Here's a here's a no. uh, here's a news flash for you. You know how Son of Sam got caught? A parking ticket. We have Manny Grossman in the chatter. Thank you, thank you. He got caught because they found him. They they checked the parking tickets in the area, yeah, uh, and he got uh, a parking pop, ticket. Pop, pop quiz, Ray. Uh, Wheat Car was already reporting uh, David Berkowitz to law enforcement before that 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 parking ticket. I, I know both cases there, bud. But uh, she was a girl in Yonkers. Can, yeah, correct. Uh, can you place O'Hare at any of the four canonical locations, Ray? Have you have you nailed him down there? Place him at any of the four canonical locations. They nobody can be placed. That he he was working in San Francisco at the time. Okay, we'll take it. But here's the thing: on Stevenson Arthur, Street, Arthur Lee Allen is such a prime suspect. Not that any of us endorse him, but he's such a prime suspect because he's perfectly local there in Vallejo. So, well, I mean, so was O'Hare. Right, I guess, but you just, I don't know, it hasn't, it hasn't quite. Uh, how, I don't know how many times I have to say this. Michael O'Hare, but according to his own resume, was working at the Arthur D. Little office in San Francisco beginning in 1967. And I know he was still there. Uh, here's another news flash. Hey, for Ray, Richard. pop quiz. How, how, how come he doesn't, uh, when uh, Falk identifies the white suspect at Presidio Heights, how does that description and the composite sketch uh, uh, mesh with O'Hare? Because isn't isn't O'Hare some some bearded gentleman, or is that uh, is that Penn? I can't keep all these uh, all these guys straight. Well, they both have worn beards at one time or another. So does he look anything like the Presidio Heights guy? 
Uh, you, if you read Time 17, Gareth Penn does this whole thing where he's comparing M Michael O'Hare's face to the uh, Presidio Heights sketch. You know, here's the, pro the problem with the Presidio Heights sketch is that half the male population looks like it, including myself. So I kind of move, I kind of stay away from the sketch. You know, it, uh, Mike Morford had this thing where he said, Ross Sullivan is great suspect because he looks more like that sketch than anybody else. Okay, but like I said, if you follow the Golden State Killer case, Joseph James D'Angelo didn't look like any of the sketches, and there were like 20 of them. Yeah. Great, got it. All right, uh, do you care to take this question, Rich, on the uh, Arthur Lee Allen and Melvin Belli, or are you, you good on that? Other than apparently there's another comment that... Is there uh, any connection between Arthur... Arthur Allen and Melvin Belli, which is... Well, I don't know of any connection between Arthur Lee Allen and Melvin Belli. Arthur Lee Allen wrote a letter to a friend and said Melvin Belli offered to represent him. That's uh, what maybe, maybe, this guy says. Maybe, maybe, maybe Ray knows more about that than me. I'm, I'm not well, I talked to Melvin Belli, so I think I'm the only uh, um, Zodiac researcher who actually talked to him. All right, boys, I, 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 we're at like 2.30 right now, and uh, and Richard was kind enough to uh, fight through his, his COVID for this debate. So I think I'm going to run. Oh, he had COVID. Um, I'm sorry. Sorry to hear that, Richard. Yeah, he's a little under the weather. It's um, also about 9.30 in Britain, isn't it? Well, I think it's yeah, COVID. I'm, I'm going to, uh, something like that. I'm going I'm uh, to wrap us, gentlemen. 9.32, yeah. Um, All right, I hope you feel better. Here's the thing, Ray. You can't call me sensitive when you melted down on Ned DeHaan over some random comment in his comment section. You totally know that Ned can't control that. You gotta, you gotta squash it with Ned, Ray. It's, it's too much. Uh, you, you're completely misinterpreting the, the entire interaction as usual, uh, Ross. As, as usual, Rich. Well, as you, as you often do. And, and as you do too, Ray. Hey, uh, um, people say your, your whole theory the biggest, is nonsense. The biggest can meltdown I, I've ever seen is when Ross question. called me a bitch. After after all I did all I did was say what were you saying, Rich? All I did was say to Ross that the, he wasn't that question, serious right? if he was calling the, the the hunters squirrel hunters, and then he calls me a bitch, and now right. he's now he's right. Here's the thing: you you said that you didn't want to debate anymore because of what Ross Geraci said about you on his show. Ross Tracy didn't say anything about you on his show. Richard Grinnell and Druzer brought up your name. I but you were said, agreeing with them. I said, I, uh, agreeing with what, though? I said, I don't know You kept anything saying about agree to go back and watch those shows. You keep saying agreed, agreed, agreed. What was the point? What was the point that I agreed with? I forget what the point was. Okay, so you nitpicked me calling raccoon hunters squirrel hunters, which you then got wrong in your own video. Well, I, 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 let's ask Rich, Richard uh, what he thinks about this. Richard, wouldn't you say calling somebody is a, a bitch is worse than, than questioning them about the squirrel hunters? I think when you what call somebody a bitch, you have gone over, you have crossed the line. Ray, here's something for you. When you left uh, Ned DeHaan's channel and said, I was annoyed that I was being heckled. I agree that it's better for people to deconstruct arguments constructively and have a sensible debate and heckling and calling names is not the right way to go forward. You would agree with that. And Do you have you any symptoms, by that, the way? For the hang, on, hang on. That You cited that reason for leaving Ned DeHaan and not doing those other two interviews. But you donate to a guy who has made a career out of insulting people and calling people names like nut job, conspiracy theorist, lunatic, fraud. You mean Ross? You're pally with this guy. And <laughs> No, I mean Tom Voigt, you know. So be consistent. Ross, he's talking Voigt about big... you. Go ahead. No, get he's, him. Talking about, he's talking about our boy Tom Voigt and, 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 and his, he's pointing out your inconsistency, yeah. Ray, and the fact that you don't have a standard. You like when people agree with you. And I quite literally said, 
I don't know anything about Ray Grant, and you went off on me and spoke my name out of turn, which is why you got called the B word, I could easily say, well, Ray Grant's not a serious researcher. He just high racked, uh, he just hijacked Gareth Penn's theory and then added this dude's mom Ross. who has a totally nonsensical conceptual art based on yeah, mathematics. Yeah, didn't I take that comment down, though? He can't plan. You did, yeah. but... Right. Okay, yeah, but sure I took did. it down. Should have never did it in the first place. Right? Well, the I did it for is... five seconds, and then I thought better of it. Okay, well, we, we got past it, but the fact of the matter is you can't say I'm sensitive, and then you go off and won't work with Ned DeHaan anymore because of a random comment posted in his... Well, let me remind you of a few... a few, a few in, Let Rich's me point. remind you of a few inconvenient facts that the two of you seem to be ignoring here, okay? First of all, as far as donations go, to Ned DeHaan, minimum 300 bucks. Let me get my, I'm going to get my uh, thing what's, here. We've heard, you, we've heard you list it all before, Ray, but what's the point here, though? We have Ned. And Ned gets, Ned gets a minimum 300 bucks from Ray Grant, okay? That's just for starters, okay? Okay. Then we have... Um, Who's the guy for Zodiac Killer Channel? It's uh, Steve Beaumont. Steve gets 300 Steve gets minimum, okay? Now, here's the thing. What you have to remember is where is Ned the moderator on the Zodiac Killer Channel? Now, Ned's uh -huh. going to come back and say, well, wait a minute. I don't make any money from Zodiac Killer Channel. No, but you do get... You know, your message out there on that channel. You're the moderator there, okay? Then I'm accused of insulting Druzer. And let me ask Richard Grinnell about this. Richard, how much is 200 pounds in American money? What? What's, what's the point, Ray? We're totally lost. Because it cost me 200 pounds to get Steve to upload Druzer's... Um, interview on the Zodiac Expert series. I paid Steve an additional 200 pounds, which is 259 bucks, just to get, if you go over to the Zodiac Expert series and you look for Z Druzer, the only reason that uh, video's up is that I paid Steve 259 bucks American, which is 200 bucks where Richard lives, okay? So here's the point. 859 bucks worth of my money went to those three people. Okay. Uh -huh. So some, but somehow I'm the bad guy. If you can figure that out, you're better you're off. The, than, you're better than I am. Because Druzer's our boy and we thank you for getting his interview. Yeah. Yeah. But, exactly. Yeah. And here's you're the, the thing. I'm asking, you I'm catch asking, me. Go ahead, Rich. Right. Ray, I'm asking you. I'm asking you. When are you going to call out Tom Voigt for heckling and calling people names? I like started donating to Tom. I started donating to Tom in 2010. Okay, and then Tom banned me from his site because I I pissed off um, Seagull, uh, Tahoe 27, and Tracers and the Foreigner. So I got banned from Tom's site from 2014 till 2019. Then Tom lets me back on his site, okay? Okay. I agree with you. I would I do not endorse Tom's, you know, going to people and, you know, you know, it's his um uh, getting into fights with people, okay? But here's here's the thing. What you have to understand is every day Tom gets emails, all of the, I'm sure Ross gets them. I guarantee you Ross gets emails about, hey, I have a theory about the Zodiac Killer. You know, I think it's this guy. I think it's this guy who lives like in the next block up the street. And I'm sure Richard has gotten emails like that. And I've gotten emails like that, okay? Now imagine how much stuff like that Tom Voigt gets. And Tom has reached a point now, and I, I don't have a problem with him doing this, where he tends to take a dismissive attitude toward people. And, you know, maybe I guess it's unfortunate, but I mean, I can understand where he's coming from because he just gets that stuff all the time. But see, here's the thing. 
We wouldn't, Richard Grinnell and I would not be having this conversation if it were not for Tom's website, because that's where we're getting a lot of our, uh, a great deal of our uh, source material. Yeah, I, I don't know, Rich. Apparently, Tom Tom likes Ray for some reason. He <coughs> spoke highly of him. I don't know how Ray was able to win win Tom's favor. In, in, By the way, I didn't add, there's, there's one other uh, Zodiac person that I gave $100 to recently that I didn't put on that list, but... Uh, I think he. I think if I mention him, he's going to be embarrassed. So I'll just leave his name off there. You, you can go ahead and mention him. There's no secrets here, Ray. No, I don't want to mention him. <laughs> All right, we'll, we'll go ahead and mention him. We'll, we'll, we'll thank Ray for the first donation in PXF history to the Zodiac Files. Well, the other myself, thing is, Ross if Tracy. Richard had a donate button on his uh, website, I'd have donated to him by now. I've donated to everybody who has a donation uh, set up. Done that yeah, I've we, we, participated we, we, in. We I appreciate donate. it, Richard. And, and we, you know, we thank you for getting, uh, for getting Druzer's interview released as well. Uh, it's just the problem is you, you know, you kind of got my name mixed up in a situation there, but you know, we're, we're, we're past it now. I don't, I don't really understand how I caught the stray crossfire from a discussion that Richard and Druzer were having, but apparently I agreed with them. So that triggered you. That's fine. Uh, let's get one question for, for uh, Richard before we get out of here. If you had to choose, I know Richard's a non-suspect guy. Who would you pick to be the Zodiac amongst the known suspects? <coughs> and real quick, I, I was watching a video before we came on here where this guy was saying that Huckabee said that uh, Kane was following, following Darlene Farron around and stalking her. That's in addition to, you know, Arthur Lee Allen stalking her as well. So apparently every known suspect was stalking Darlene, which was news to me. But go ahead, Richard. <clears throat> If I, if I had to pick, I wouldn't pick anybody. I don't give them any hope whatsoever. But if I had to pick one person through the uh, the sheer volume and detail work that's been done, I'd pick Paul Door. Oh wow, you like the uh, you like that new one? No, I don't like oh, it. Now I but I'm saying I, I like I like the detail he's gone into. Okay. Yeah, I appreciate it. I know. No, no th thanks, Ray. We we can we can read. We can all read, Ray. Uh, all right, gentlemen. I think I'm going to wrap us. We're quite deep now. Uh, but well, let me got... ask Richard one last question. Be my if, guest. Okay, if you've reached this point now and you don't have a suspect, and you've been how long's your website been up since 2012? Yeah. What's the point? Why does he need a suspect? Though? He's researching the case. Well, whether you've got a suspect or not, I mean, if you have a suspect, like I have, I have a suspect. I have two suspects, which means I have a ticking clock. Now we are going to find out in the next few years if I live long enough. We're going to find out if my two suspects were the Zodiac killer because they will presumably pass away, and they may choose to keep everything secret. Who knows? But. The point is, one way or another, I will come to the end of my road as far as being a Zodiac researcher, and I'm I'm going to stop. So if you've reached this late date, and you don't have a suspect, and there isn't any way of proving any of the major suspects, look, Shell Cavalier, for all intents and purposes, isn't the Zodiac killer, even if he was the Zodiac killer, because there's no way of proving it at this point. He didn't leave anything behind. Much like his... your suspects. What? No, but my suspects are still alive. Yeah, I got it. Yeah. But yeah. what I'm saying is all of these people, Gaikowski, Arthur Lee Allen, and so forth. So why keep up a Zodiac uh, website when there's no hope of any, uh, of any uh, solution? because you can answer mysteries within the mystery. And I think the best way of identifying the Zodiac Killer is through geographic profiling. Okay, it's not, a pro hang on, it's not a proven scientific method, I know, but I think this is far more productive in honing down the area where the killer lived rather than chasing suspects all over the internet. And the, re the reason, when I analyze a Zodiac crime or a Zodiac letter or anything, I'm objective, whereas, People who have got suspects are biased. They approach every crime oh, scene, bullshit. every letter, with the suspect it's right on, it's right on. in the back of their I mind. Just, I just told you that if you go to my original book, and again, you can find it on the web archive, The Zodiac Murder Solved, you will note 
that I don't say anything about the way the crimes were committed, okay? So I didn't have any presuppositions about the way the crimes were committed. All this stuff that you're talking about that, that you're characterizing as fiction and so forth is stuff that I've come up with in the last, whatever it is, 11 or 12 years. And uh, just, just because people look at evidence and they come to a conclusion about it doesn't mean that they're fabricating. You know, um, I don't think that's what he's saying, Ray. What he's saying is you could take your mathematical cipher conceptual art argument. You see, you, and you keep apply going it back to, any... to the mathematical stuff. I'm not and just I'm... going back to the mathematical stuff. In addition to the conceptual art argument, you could apply but... that to any generic suspect, Ray, because nothing stands forensically or, or you know, geographically. But, but see, again, Richard disagrees even with the stuff that I say about about the crimes. And now we have a third argument, which is Dave Aranchek's solution to Z340. If you go to episode nine of uh, Dave's series, what you will see is there are all sorts of messages in the undertext of Z340. And one of the things that that tells us is that one of two things is true. Either the person who wrote Z340 definitely had some sort of military background where he had been a cryptographer, let's say for the Army Air Corps, as UPenn was, okay? And he knew about uh, code uh, transpositions in the Army Code Manual, or he was a cryptographer on that level. In other words, you're talking about someone who is on the same level as somebody like Dave Aranchek, okay? So how is that person a homicidal maniac. In other words, he would have to be a cryptographer first and a serial killer second. We aren't talking about somebody like BTK. No, no, Ross. No. What, what, you why have, can't you any don't person, get that level of right. expertise by accident. Why can't any person get a copy of that army code book? Any, any random person? Why do they have to be trained in, you know what I mean? I, did you look at episode nine of Dave's because he shows you all sorts of manipulations that are done in the undertext of uh, of Z340, okay? Right. And I, it, I, I'll allow it. Have we resolved all our issues, gentlemen? Well. Well, anyway, Ross, <laughs> thanks for having rose. me on. <laughs> no, I mean, if I'll, I'll, allow, I'll allow citing a ranch check. What were you saying, Rich? The no, I'm just saying, yeah, I, it's been a great discussion. I've enjoyed it. Do you have symptoms? Richard, do you have For symptoms? Me? Yeah, I've yeah. been coughing all I've been coughing all Yeah, I've got me, um, I've got me Cavonia here. Did you have, are you <laughs> vaccinated? Are you vaccinated? Yes, I've had three vaccines. Yeah. I've had three vaccines. You know what's funny is here in America, for the most part, they're not even taking COVID-19 seriously anymore. No, I don't think they are here anymore either. Yeah. So it's All right, gents, uh, I think that's basically the majority of the questions I had for the case. Uh, Ray, you're going to squash it with Ned because that's our boy. He's the, he's the best true crime channel on YouTube. So I... you guys will get that resolved. Like Thanks, I said, Ray. yeah, I continue for some reason to be the bad guy when I, you know, I, I already showed you. He, he's he's still supporting you. He's still watching your content, promoting it. Yeah, on, but on see, his channel, right? I didn't. Yeah, I don't know how many times I have to say this. I didn't insist that Ned ban the guy who is heckling me. All I asked for is that he just take the heckling off his his board, and he refused to do that. And I'll, again, the point I keep making is. If these people are showing up on, on Ned's channel, you know, like this JTK7IB, okay, and he says I'm crazy, and then I decide, okay, I don't like being called crazy, so I just won't uh, go on, on Ned's channel anymore, and then somehow I'm the bad guy, okay? I don't get it. If you think I'm crazy and I'm not posting on Ned's channel anymore, isn't, wouldn't that be a good thing? It's just it's just random YouTube comments, uh, Ray. You, you, you can't take it so yeah, so personally, but okay. In, 
we all get insulted. Yeah, exactly. Right. They they say that I smoke meth in the comments on on Ned's channel. It does. I, I'm still wait a minute. Sleep at night, you know? Well, so you're saying you don't smoke meth? How do you guys think I, I'm able to energize up for these three hour interviews? But anyway, gentlemen, we're gonna uh, we're we're gonna wrap squash it with Ned Ray. That's your your homework assignment. I'm sure you guys will resolve it. The Zodiac Files, don't Volume Three, Richard Grinnell versus Ray Grant, the legendary match. Ross, Appreciate thanks. Appreciate both your time. Ross, Thank you. thanks a lot. Thank you, Ray. Appreciate it a lot, guys. Th thanks for coming on the channel. Thanks, uh, everyone. Really Hi, Richard. It's, it's the Wild Wild West in the comments here, Ray. I, I really don't regulate it much, so, uh, you know, it is what it is down there, bud. So. Gents, can I go? Can I, read go the, uh, can I read the chat stuff uh, yeah. after the video's up or what? I'm pretty sure. You can still read it, I'm pretty sure, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Gentlemen. Yeah. Thanks for everybody coming through. Thank you, Rich. Appreciate you, man. You're, you're a good sport for the. Yeah, Richard, uh, Ross, I, I appreciate your. Uh, I hope you feel better. Uh, thanks a lot, Ross. All good, gentlemen. Thanks a lot. Uh, I'll, uh, I'll do right, my intro here. What's what that, Rich? I, I what? was just going to ask Ray, who, who's uh, taking up the offer to debate you next? Uh, that's up to Ross, really. I mean, Ross told me I was. Uh, this is my trial, uh, my trial debate. He told me we'll see how how you do on your first debate, and if you do all right, maybe we'll bring you back. So, yeah, actually, did way better than I thought. I'm gonna. I'm not even gonna lie. Uh oh. It, so, uh, but I don't know. Ray's got some issues with uh, with uh, with Horan. I think uh, maybe Richard and Radelli might have some things to resolve. So we, we can look into that, Rich. Yeah, whatever. I'm open for any debate. Yeah, I, 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 hey, why don't you get Tom Voigt and Rich uh, together? I, I would love to. It's it's difficult to get Tom Voigt for anything, uh, but we'll, we'll figure it out, guys. If you have, you want me to talk debates, to Tom? Put him in the comments. Yeah, go for it. All right, I'll ask Tom if he wants to debate Richard. I, I need him for an interview, but we'll see how it goes. Uh, all right, guys, I'm going to drop you out and do the outro. Thank you very much. Richard right, Grinnell, Zodiac Speaking Podcast, ZodiacCiphers.com. Ray Grant, uh, the Zodiac Killer solved. Do you have a website, Ray, or is it just the Wayback Machine? Uh, just on the Wayback Machine. You can go to just uh, type in Ray Grant Zodiac on YouTube. It'll take you right to my channel. Get Ray Grant's book on Amazon. All right, gents, I'm going to drop you. Just email me if you guys uh, have any more notes. All right. Thank you, gentlemen. Appreciate your time. Have All a good right. afternoon. Right. Merry Christmas, guys. Thank you, Rich. You're the man. I'm saying to you. All right. All right, guys. Wow. That was, uh, yeah, I've had some uh, interesting moments there. <laughs> that was a classic. All right. Uh, shout out to Richard and Ray for, uh, for, for coming through. Oh, uh, I know you had some other things on there, Zephyr. Let me see. You asked that one. What did Zephyr have here? We'll get him on there before he gets out of there. My opinion, Drew Basin made the best case in the Z world, but having one suspect with no fictional evidence, it just makes sense. I, I really like Drew's uh, circumstantial case for for Don Cheney. There's more requests for Prof Horan. Yeah, for sure. I'm trying not to overuse him, but I believe uh, Ray Grant and Prof Horan might have an issue they need to resolve. We're always welcome to do that here. You know, if there's ever any reason why I can't moderate, we're interested in having uh, Ned DeHaan stand in for me. <coughs> Excuse me. Go subscribe to his channel, Black Box Online Radio. Shout out to Brian. Uh, shout out to Holly Toshki, um, everybody else who came through, my boy Gaz, uh, he's over on the Moss Shinobi channel, thank you Sean, appreciate you guys, the Zodiac Files 4 is coming soon, the Gavita Beach Murders, Gaviota Beach Murders, I've pronounced it both ways, uh, it should be awesome, um, it's coming very soon, uh, check out the memberships guys. The, gor the gorilla level, the inspector level, the vigilante level. Go check that out in the join if you want to join the channel. Upcoming streams will be, there will be some subscriber only streams. There will be some membership only streams. I have a massive, massive interview going down tomorrow, Sunday. I don't know if I can announce it yet, though. Let me see if my guest confirmed. Let me see if my guest confirmed. Okay, he didn't confirm yet, but just stay tuned to my channel. Like, subscribe, share. There's going to be a massive YouTuber coming on, possibly my favorite YouTube channel. It's a case that I haven't covered yet, 
uh, on the uh, on the channel. Not Zodiac related, but I think you guys will like it. It's a, a, a semi cold case, so to speak. Uh, so as soon as that is confirmed by my guests, I'm going to put up the live, and that's that. So check out the memberships. Appreciate the super chats, Zephyr. You can you guys can drop the super thanks. Uh, multiple ways to support the channel. Go get the merch on the spring. Get your Planet X films. Mug, shirts, t-shirts, stickers. I don't know how this is going to come across on that Zodiac Cypher background, but you could uh, get these stickers. Doesn't really look that great on my virtual background. Maybe if I put it in front of my face. Uh, so that's how I should have conducted the interview. But yeah, shout out to Ray. Shout out to Rich. I think we resolved most of our issues. Any final questions for me before I go? I don't mind sticking around chit-chatting you guys. I'm not nearly as interesting as the, uh, as the debate arguments there. Appreciate it. Appreciate it, Zeph. Appreciate it, EV. Um, yeah, I don't know. The debates are always open, guys. Anybody who has issues to resolve, I really want to see Rich and Rodelli. Uh, hoping to get Rodelli up next for the Zodiac Files interview series. Um, I think that is about all I have for you. Check out the merch. Check out memberships. Appreciate the super chats and the super thanks. Um, Zodiac Files episode four coming soon. More interviews. Just keep, keep the subs coming in, guys. Right now, we just need the subs. That's the last milestone we need for monetization. I think I am out. Unless you guys have any final questions for me. I'll stick around for one question. I'm thinking about doing a... Uh, who doesn't Ray have beef with? Well, we'll try to get all his issues resolved there. You saw how, how me and him went down on, ca on, on camera. I'd like to think we're in a better place now. Bring somebody on and people call in to challenge them. Yeah, that's a good idea. That's a good idea. I like that. Um, like I want to I wanna get Rodelli up first. Uh, I have some other ideas of, of, of maybe getting someone from law enforcement that might be uh, interested in a debate. That's the direction I want to go in. Uh, I think that's about it on my end, folks. I don't see anything else in the chat for me. So I'm going to let it ride. Special thanks to Richard. Go check out the ZodiacCyphers.com. Get Ray Grant's book on, uh, oh yeah, we were talking about shirts earlier. I wanted to show you guys my, can't really see it. Where's the graphic? My Punisher shirt, there he is. There's the Punisher, yeah. All right, <laughs> painting party, that's an awesome name, y'all. I'm gonna put that up there. That's a, that's a genius name, I like that. You can tell this guy's not a Graysmith fan. Uh, shout out to everybody that came through. Follow me on Twitter. Follow my tags there, Ross Tracy PXF. Also follow the official PXF Twitter. That is at Planet X Filmwork. Uh, thinking about doing a Q&A with me at a thousand subs, and we're right around the corner. So if you haven't subscribed yet, please subscribe. Probably just be a QA and a with me. We're still talking about my boy Mosh Shinobi and doing some, uh, doing some sub and membership only shows. Definitely some movie reviews, movie comparisons, breakdowns, deconstructions. So if there's no other questions for me, folks, I know I just said that like 10 times and also the Zodiac Files episode uh, four is coming soon. I've said that about 10,000 times. We'll definitely be going down. Ooh, I would like, yeah, I would like Ken Mains. Uh, I'm really interested in that stuff he said about... Um, Riverside, how he said the footprints were from the groundskeeper Cleophus Martin. That was that was interesting. He was the only one to say that. I don't know. I, I, I haven't had any luck getting in touch with him. So if anybody has a link to get Ken Maines, I'd really like to get uh, Misty Johansson, uh, Tahoe 27 of the forum that found the uh, the uh, Wheel of Death, Lady Doom Wheel of Death. That'd be interesting. Um, I would love to get a Ranchak. He's he's pretty tough to get. Uh, but yeah, so hopefully Rodelli up next. Um, yeah, I'm trying not to get stuck in the mold of just like interviewing every book author that has uh, that has just yeah, written a book about the Zodiac because we know some of those are nonsensical. I wouldn't mind bringing back the the Cooper Chronicles, uh, maybe doing some Cooper power panels, uh, definitely some more Cooper guests. I want to get my boy Chris W on who wrote uh, Take the Money and Run. Uh, he's a he's a Amelia Earnhardt expert. Earnhardt, Earnhardt, I think it's Earnhardt. Uh, shout out to Drew Beeson. He came through earlier. Merry Christmas, everybody. I don't think I missed any shout outs. How, 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 do, you guys, how do you guys think it went? Who, who do you guys think won? Richard, Ray, leave in the comments who you thought won. I, I got a poll up too. 
uh, a pre-poll right before we went live. So, I think I'm going to bounce. If you guys have no other cues for your boy in the chat, I'm about to roll. I've been, uh, whew, I'm, I'm, I'm famished from this uh, interview, putting, putting in work for you guys. Like, sub, share. Feel free to, uh, to join the membership if you want to support the channel. And uh, that, that is true. <laughs> Thank you. I, I appreciate the, 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 the moderator winning the debate. That's always a, a good sign. Uh, and that is true. Ray Grant was the first to donate to PXF, the Zodiac Files series, in PXF history. So that was not a lie. That wasn't fake news. That was, uh, that was verified fact. There is a PayPal button in my link tree, or you can join a membership. Uh, but we accept all donations if you want to support the series. Cash App, PayPal, Venmo. Uh, I think that's everything. Cat Daddy Steve, appreciate you. Subscribe. If you haven't subscribed, subscribed. I need subs. And once I hit 1K, I can never ask I, you to subscribe again, or at least I won't need to. I'd like to wish you all a happy Christ Mass, in the words of the Zodiac. And I'm about to jet here. Appreciate you guys. I'll have something for you soon. Hopefully a massive interview uh, tomorrow afternoon. I'm out. Subscribe.